welcome back everyone day two of our we love indies week i hope you guys are having a lot of fun i think you are because a lot of you are showing up and i've gotten a lot of great feedback um but let me know which streams you've liked so far what kind of content you like we're trying to keep it like a nice funky mix for you a lot of technical stuff a lot of marketing stuff a lot of community stuff so to keep it fresh for you every single day but uh for those who don't know and you're tuning in for the first time this is our creator spotlight series and it's an entire summer where we're going to dedicate it to uh, you and all our favorite creators. So all Made With Unity creators bringing something really, really unique to the table and uh, or that are, we're willing to show us some uh, stuff under the hood. So I hope you're really enjoying this. I'm Carol. I'm the host here for our Twitch channel and program manager at Unity. And this is my co-host, Hassan. Say hi. Hey, everyone. I'm Hassan, community manager at Unity and Twitch co-host with Carol for the Creator Spotlight. Yeah, thanks everyone for already showing up. Uh, chat is very active. Remember to ask all your questions. We're here to answer anything you'd like. All the secrets will be revealed in the stream. My co-hosts are already like, no, Carol, no. <laughs> <laughs> so much excitement in the chat right now. I'm loving this. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, Hassan, why don't you kick it off with some new and exciting things happening in the asset store for the next uh, yeah, couple so months? Yeah, so right now we have the Smash Hit Summer Sale on the Asset Store. It's a six-week sale. We're currently on the fourth week. Uh, each week has a different theme. Currently, we're in the Fantasy Week, right? So all kinds of assets that are there to help you build your fantasy game are 50% off right now. Uh, next week is the Sci-Fi Sale. So next week, you're going to have all, you know assets that will help you build out a Sci-Fi game. And then finally, we'll be wrapping up the whole Smash Hit Summer Series with the uh, best of so it's like kind of a like greatest hits of all the assets that were on sale uh and so those will all be 50 percent off uh so if you want a link to that we're going to drop a link to the sale in the chat but there's also a link in our description in the info for uh, below in the in our, on our twitch page uh and so for today's show we have pray for the gods an incredible boss climbing open world adventure game where you play as a lone hero in a never ending uh, winter. You have to fight massive beasts to survive and return the world to proper order. Uh, I can't wait for you to see this game uh, and to chat to the team behind it. Uh, let's look at the trailer. I know you're already excited. I can already tell that chat is very excited. Everyone's been waiting <laughs> for a game like this because giant boss climbing should be its subgenre, <laughs> honestly. But yeah, welcome team um, from No Matter. Why don't we start up with Brian? Tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just want to say thanks for coming to the stream and thank you, Unity, Carol, and Hassan. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course. It's been a lot you. of fun doing rehearsals and all this other stuff. So I just want to say thanks for that. <laughs> um, so I, my name is Brian, uh, Brian Parnell. Um, uh, I'm the director on Pray for the Gods. Uh, the three of us uh, are been working on this game for quite a while. And um, what I do is a lot of the art, um, some of the design, and a lot of the kind of businessy backend type stuff. Nice. Let's kick it over to Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, and thanks for coming to the stream. Uh, so I'm mainly technical artist, I would say, is like encompassing role. But in terms of I do basically everything that Chen and Brian can do. And a lot of that is gameplay programming and also environment. Art. Yeah. I tend to be the glue between them. As Brian always refers to that. Yeah. There are, we always we always need that person on the team for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, Chen, please tell us about yourself. 
Hi, uh, I'm Chen. Uh, I'm the programmer, so I only do program. I don't do art. Nothing no, else, I think. Not allowed. <laughs> Definitely not allowed. Uh, yeah, I'm not allowed. <laughs> Chen can't touch I, I, the I, art. <laughs> One thing well, we, we learned from rehearsals is that Chen <laughs> can't touch the art. <laughs> yeah, Chat. So I'm do, like, programming and uh, console porting and... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Ch Chad is extremely excited about Chen. They seem to uh, have missed Chen and have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I usually yeah. don't show up in like social media. Okay. Facebook, I think so. he does have a Twitter. He has he a does. cult following. I, it seems. He actually has a Twitter. I think he's still the egg image. I don't think he ever put an image up or anything. Oh, we that's made classic. him get a, a I don't know Twitter. if he has a tweet yet. I don't think he's ever tweeted. No, he hasn't I done anything. I don't think I tweeted. I <laughs> no. just have a cow and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's actually perfect because we're going to, that's what we're going to be talking about during this stream, yeah. <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> about Chen's just Twitter. Chen's Twitter account. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> What's great for the gods? <laughs> we're going to talk about Chen. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just essentially, you know, like uh, your game like went viral, viral ish, you know, like you're one of those games. Like, so we we're going to talk a lot about the content strategy behind it, what you did. You really impressed the community. A lot of people like uh, we're going to I'm going to be really excited about the deep dive in that. And we're going to talk also about the technical stuff. So how Chen mm -hmm. and Tim managed to make all the things happen and uh, bring to bring to life all the things that happen in Brian's brain. I think Chen will have a really fun time explaining um that job uh to us um so yeah really excited about that so tell us about the the history how did your team get together where were you before i think you were like you all have a long history of AAA. like yeah yeah i mean i'll um chat about it so we all met basically in boston and uh god like in 2011 or 12 so we were working at a company called Tencent Boston that was, um, if you know of this small company, it's kind of unknown, it's called Tencent. Um, at the time, no one knew who they were. Uh, now everyone should, because they own just about, I don't know how much of the industry. But um, at that time, they had invested, I think, in Riot, and they were putting a little bit of money into um, our, our studio at the time. And so the three of us had met, and we were working on... Uh, sort of a big open world type game, MMO y thing or something. And then we shifted to um, sort of smaller social space on uh, Facebook and we released a game called Robot Rising. And in that time, that's where we really got uh, the three of us had already been working on sort of side projects with Unity. And this was like old, like Unity 4, I think. And uh, we all were kind of pushing our studio to 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 use unity um and so that's where we really got our feet wet as even as a team working on projects together and so around that time um that studio sort of you know went through like most studios after a couple of years they uh let some people go and we decided hey uh chen and myself uh and as, as also tim we all decided to go um to where sort of mobile social social games were sort of picking up we thought we could bring sort of a traditional uh, mindset and uh, I guess how on traditional games that we were tending to push graphics a bit more. We thought, hey, we could do that in the social mobile state space. So we went to San Francisco um, and started working there and realized kind of depending, I mean, it's come a, uh, quite a ways, but at that point, those games were still pretty soul sucking to work on. And uh, around that time, we started um, going for coffee walks to just blow off steam and uh, we just kind of walk around downtown San Francisco. And so we started saying like, hey, I think around the time Apple announced Metal, which was their sort of beefed up version of graphics and Unity supported Metal um, or they were, they were going to, I can't remember, but we thought, hey, you know, we could do something. Um, uh, it's almost like kind of Infinity Blade had come out around that time. We were like, we could do something like this, you know, like this is something we could we could work towards. And uh, so Chen mentioned like, yeah, we should do Dynasty Warriors. <laughs> and <Yes>. uh, <laughs> out of the three of us, like I'm the one that does the art. And, uh, you know, I at least have done enough rigging and animation to understand like that is that's a lot of work. Getting all those animations is a lot of work. And so I was like, whoa, 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 whoa why don't we just focus on like one boss and one character? And if we can get that to work, um you know 
we can then go make more of that. And so I mentioned like, you know, there was this game when I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I played a little bit. I didn't have a PlayStation, um, PlayStation 2 at the time, uh, but my buddy did and he was so excited. And it was this game called Shadow Colossus. And as an artist, I, I think most artists, we tend to um, always, whenever I was in the, the art pits and all the games I always worked on, someone would always bring up Shadow Colossus. Why hasn't anybody made that game? Why hasn't anybody taken that formula and sort of, mm -hmm. it's the best, it's the best game ever. And I mean, and especially when you think back to like what the PS2 could do and what teams were able to be able to do, like that, that game to this day still um, it, is. It definitely pushed the limit for sure. Oh my God. Like. Uh, the it's, bloom, the post-processing effects were all completely and, done just for perspective. Yeah, and and when you look at even a lot of the design stuff that they were doing, like there was a lot of things in there that, um, I mean, tons of people have made huge YouTube videos on dissecting just what was in there. And, and, to, and to hear some of the stories I've heard, I mean, it's all stories from what I've heard, right? I, I don't know for sure, but that a lot of it was cut or was like sort of unfinished, but to even be able to pull off what they did it's mind-blowing to think back to like what was even possible back then on the ps2 so you know i i, I just kind of pitched that like hey why you know because i've always as characters love to make giant characters and and that allowed me then to focus really on one thing if we could you know keep our scope small that was like the big push because we wanted to stay a group of three um and we could you know we saw sort of in terms of the market, there were there were possibilities for small teams to actually be able to make sort of big big things. And I mean, yes, the pun intended, but like the idea being, yeah, you can make things that are you know pretty exceptional with because the tools are getting to be so available. And um, and Unity was obviously part of that decision um, for us because we had been using it for so long, and it was starting to really show some legs in terms of um what it was capable of as a as a engine so um yeah from that point we spent uh we decided to do it and and make the jump and let's figure out how to do this so we I, I, when did we start guys it was like summer of 2015 or something or yeah it was like no no 2014 2014 2000 <laughs> okay it, yeah i think it, but it was a while when we started just spare time on the weekends kind of piecing this together like what is it going to be how does it work and uh you know we thought <laughs> you know it's it's funny to look back and think what you think is easy versus what nothing's easy <laughs> but we <laughs> you're the climbing part you know chen you got you said i mean you said you got what in two weeks up and running yeah like working you know Originally, I say like, hey, because this is climbing game, so we should prototype this because this is the main thing. So I spend about two weeks and make it work. So you can, the, the character, we all use a asset store character or whatever. So we put a giant zombie and you can climb on the zombie. And two weeks, we make it work. So I, I thought, like, game's hey, done. Shit. Game's done. Ship we, we're it. totally able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually uh, a really good way to like. You guys used a ton of asset store stuff. Like you sent us the list, and we were kind of it was kind of staggering. But like I talk about this all the time. Some people get hyper focused on the details and like you know all right. the art and stuff. Like you you can't have a team like uh, we saw yesterday. Uh, Harold Halibut, where they have a massive team and they were oh they came gosh, from yeah. a background of artists and they could really focus on that. And that was their niche. But if you're just yeah. A game that's focused on mechanics and you want it to have a hook and it's good don't waste your time on that just throw you know like asset store assets are there for a reason it's like a nice placeholder and you can develop on it or and some yeah. things you keep and some things you don't and you and know that's a, that, that's a lot it. of times you can learn from those assets too even if you don't keep them you learn you know what they did to make it better for your own yeah, yeah and then you can mm -hmm. oh go ahead i would say on the art side i mean there is so we i think gave you a long list of more tech focused or tool based type stuff but like the sheer amount of so right now i'm actually looking at the asset store and the signed vfx top down effects i bought that i think oh, a couple of weeks ago to look at some shaders we're not using any of it but mostly i look to see how did that artist do it 
right? Or how did that team mm -hmm. pull that off? Because mm -hmm. I, you know, VFX is literally uh, black magic in the sense that like people don't agree. <laughs> it's very unique, and it's like every case usage is unique to that game because yeah. of how they render or how it needs to run at certain CPU frame rates and all that stuff. But like uh a lot of the stuff like as an artist too like making rocks like how many times do you need to make rocks right like it's and making a good <laughs> rock is hard um especially in our game you can climb on everything so we found pretty quickly like i can spend all this time trying to make all these assets then i have to make them climbable or at the main the main bit we can you know pick up I think this is like a Boulder Packs 3 rock set is what I've been using forever. And instead we sort of put some other shaders, I retextured it and it's our own assets. I think we used Malbers. Um, uh, he's awesome. Uh, I, I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head, but like I chat with him frequently uh, on Twitter and um, ask him like, hey, what's coming next? Or can we, you know, in a lot of his animations are animations we used on even on the bosses. But on like the deer, I remember I took his deer model uh, and completely retextured it to make it look realistic, put our fur on it. So it's like you it's it's to get you that extra. I mean, if it can get you 30 percent of the way there without having to spend, you know, a half a day or a day. Like that's how we tried to look at the asset store was, you know, a, a way for us to um, shave off those extra couple of days, extra couple of hours to get things in game as fast as possible so that we could. You know, really, either pass or fail it, and um, and so that savings. Some of those, yeah, you have some some of those asset store assets in the uh, those animations in the final version of the game. Oh yeah, still, oh, still yeah. in there. Yeah, I mean, they may not be in some cases. They not, may not be exact. Like we have to tweak. Like oh, the leg needs to move here or that. But like quadruped animations are a pain in the butt, and we, me, that is, uh, I am old school. So I learned off by character suit to a biped. And yeah. that is what we use uh, for better or for worse. And um, the uh, <laughs> Mulber is actually used biped, which is why I was like, oh my gosh, like you're one of the like rare, you know, diamonds in the rough that use this. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, he was kind enough to send me some of those biped files so that I could make those changes for what I, you know, because otherwise it's, um, it's not really worth his time for me to be asking for very specific one-off type stuff, right? In the asset store, I don't look at as they're not making your game for you, right? Like, and, and I think some people maybe think of the asset store that way, but really it's, it's mm -hmm. like a partner. It really is the way I look at it as someone who's, you know, we also have worked with outsource studios here and there to assist with um, odds and ends that we've needed. Um, and it's been helpful for very specific type things which is, I think, where it makes sense. But for like these generic broad approaches, like I need a bunch of rocks. I mean, you can go to an outsource studio. It'll probably just be more expensive, but those will be your rocks, right? They probably won't be able to share them or anything. But for our game, it's like, and for our scope of what we're trying to do, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, and if someone can go and be like, they're using the same, it's like, it's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> It's you a made it your own because it live. It's it's like a rock, but it's living in the world you've built, yeah. and it has the lighting and the. Oh, aesthetic and I, I mean, that... trust me, those rocks have been massaged and reworked and changed. I mean, I've done a Misogyn, lot. Massaging rocks. Yeah. <laughs> For the next hour, I'm gonna tell you the story of how I downloaded the rocks. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> but we will Love go it. into how uh, Chen ma managed to magic all the fur and things like that. So we will get oh, into yeah. that. and the climbing and all that stuff. <laughs> but I, just, I just want to say I think that approach to learning VFX, you know, downloading VFX and reverse engineering them to kind of understand them and then create your own. That is really the way to go. Like uh, we have. Yeah some free assets too that are from unity on the asset store that oh you yeah like i downloaded asset that too yeah the 2018 asset pack you download it a uh, particle pack and you just there's some reverse slick, engineer that stuff and, yeah, yeah there's some slick effects in there like on the smoke and fog site i thought Absolutely. that was really impressive yeah some nice. good fire there too yeah yeah we have yeah. a whole list of uh all the assets that they use in case you guys are curious i'm going to drop them in like the discord after the stream so that you guys can go take a look so you can join it there if you want to join our discord as well Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you had mentioned the um, sh the Shadow of Colossus inspiration, and I I love how you don't shy away from that uh, comparison at all. But it's actually like the driver 
for this project could you speak a little more to that and that relationship yeah, yeah. yeah so the uh you know when we started working on it and and uh about i think about a half a year to a year into it um i think we were all sort of like all right well what do we do with this right like are we going to just keep working on this in our spare time forever like we need to see if there's interest um because hmm. because prior to that chen and i worked on a game together and tim was working with another friend i mean everyone just so anybody knows every developer is always has a side project somewhere and so chen and i were working on with another friend of ours tim was working on one with his old friend so like we all had our own little projects specifically also at this time in unity and uh you know chen and i got the game completely done it was based off of i don't know like moon base commander we called it kingdom commander i think there's still a youtube video of our trailer that we made um but it was sort of like a proof of concept in a sense like uh you know can we you know and we we it's a fully playable game but we realized at that time uh we couldn't market it because you know under specific clauses contractual with our company it was like we were worried we didn't want to upset them and stuff so we just kind of finished it and it just never went anywhere and so um we didn't want to do that again and you know we spent a, go a good deal of our lives working on that game uh in oh, the spare yeah. in our spare time and so this this was more of like hey we need to prove a concept and, and i would say really to anybody i've talked with multiple friends that are saying hey i want to go india i want to do this is don't f don't finish your game before you tell people about it like you, what you want to do is like another the, one of the studios I was working at the time was what they referred to as like game in a frame, like make a screenshot or a concept or a drawing of what you think your game is. That's the easiest way. But if you are using assets and you have something playable, make a trailer because a good way of making a trailer helps identify like sort of the 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 what you're trying to accomplish in the game. You know, don't don't make it a giant you know narr unless your game is a narrative game, but like really just try to impress upon the player like what what is sort of the catch or the hook of this game and what is the feel and everything else and you can get a pretty good response from that to decide like do i keep going or what do i need to you know what what do i need to do to capture the audience's attention because you i mean making games mm. takes years to finish it ship it and everything else and nothing would be worse i think to any developer to to just go in making this game because most time we're making games we're making games partially for ourselves but for people to enjoy and so we want to make sure that there's an audience there at at by the time you decide to finish this game and have people play it. Mm -hmm. So right. we said, hey, let's make this trailer. And that took us, uh, God, more than a month, I think, make, maybe a full yeah. month or a month plus. A month and a half. I mean, like half a month kind of planning it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and there was no timeline yet. Timeline didn't exist. Um, and this was mostly, I mean, I think I drew a couple things, but Tim, you pretty much had to run this thing. Like literally, oh. like, I, I don't know if we're yeah. showing the trailer or not, but like it shows her yeah. or, yeah. you know, crawling up the mountain. I mean, I can go into that more <laughs> later, but basically we put this trailer out and, you know, we were completely and still, I think, socially inept in terms of social media. Um, we sort of fumble through it and just threw it up on, I think, Facebook and uh twitter i think was the first time i've ever used twitter so i was like i didn't even know uh like when people were responding i was just hitting the heart button because i didn't know like what a response meant like if everyone was seen like i still i'm pretty pathetic when it comes to twitter but um uh <laughs> so we put it up i think on a wednesday night and i was assured that it had failed <laughs> i was <laughs> like well that's it like we're only gonna get like five people and then we learned very quickly what viral meant and how our, thankfully our friends um, that we had known for years on Facebook had shared it with their friends. And uh, the YouTube video started picking up and very quickly having been in, in shipped games, uh, like I worked at Harmonix on uh, the Beatles game and Rock Band 2. Prior to that, I worked on like Titan Quest, which was sort of a, now a fan cult, but like a Diablo clone. Um, back then now we call them arpgs but mm -hmm. um and to see how hard it was to market games and to see the amount of eyeballs and interest from press alone i was like this this is unique like this is not normal and uh i still remember my wife was like preparing to like give me the pat on the back like well you did like you got a th about a thousand views on youtube good job now go back to your real job 
And <laughs> by like Friday or Saturday, I'm like <laughs> texting Tim and Chen and like, all right, are we ready to move? Because we were living in San Francisco and there's no yeah. way yeah. to, oh. you know, because we funded this ourselves before we did our Kickstarter, you know, it right. was all out of our savings and everything else. Like there's no way I'm going to pay, you know, any kind of housing in San Francisco is incredibly expensive right. that right. we would be, you know, broke within a matter of months, just, uh, uh, just living, just sleeping in San Francisco. So, um, so yeah, we prepped like, all right, we're going to do this. Um, just, you know, and, and the funny thing is from a shadow classes perspective, I remember Saturday, the Saturday night that we had that week that we put it out again, email. And at that time I was working on a VR game called Farpoint. Um, and that we were sort of in the Sony studios in uh, San Mateo. Um, and so I knew the Sony, like what a proper, proper Sony email was. And sure enough, it's a Sony email from, I forget his name now, but it was one of the level designers from Shadow Colossus. Now he, I think he's in biz dev in Japan. And he's like, hey, uh, I worked on, you know, and he explains to me, he works on Shadow Colossus and or worked on it um, as a level designer. And he was like, this looks really cool. Can you please bring it to PS4? And I mean, as a developer, I was just like, oh my God. Like I remember it was like three in the morning or something. I was talking with Tim because Tim and I couldn't <laughs> yeah. sleep. Dream and, moment. Uh, and we're like, holy, you know, yeah. wow. Well, I couldn't sleep too because I kept looking at the view count. I was like, okay, it's going up. It's got, like just so surprised by how well it was doing. Yeah. Before it, we, like, we yeah. keep going on this, I would love to give the chat some context. So let's cut to that trailer uh, oh, sure. and, sh okay. and show it to the audience. So we'll cut to the teaser uh, Final 14 trailer and then we'll be right back after that. So right off the bat, people are already asking, um, are the job, art job apps open? <laughs> <laughs> and that's just the 2015 trailer. Wait till yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so uh, one thing I found very interesting was that you decided to group together to work on this trailer. But these days I find most teams, when they have you know, an idea for a, for a game, go straight for a demo, right? But you decided to go for a trailer instead of a demo. Which I think is interesting because I, I feel like the, maybe the scope for a trailer is actually a bit smaller because it doesn't need to be fully playable. But are there any other reasons you decided for trailer, not demo at the time? Uh, so when we, yeah, that, I'm just so people understand too that all of what they saw there um, was either playable or uh, in the sense like we called that like our pitch build. So it was, you could climb on that boss you could actually do the things we were showing all those things were actually possible um it wasn't completely like all canned or faked but mm. um it was more approach of instead of, yeah building out an entire demo which can take quite a bit of time in terms of all the edge case fixing you know having to worry about frame rate does it run on this system does it run on that you know it, it what we were trying to do is just just get a gauge on is there interest in this because to get a demo can take easily another six six months to a year. So especially at the at the speed that we were able to work part time, right? We were working in our evening sort of where we could find time. So um, I would say, yeah, I mean, especially when you try to get a team together, like I think a lot of small indie or or start indie or like side project people, you know, groups. It's like, hey, do you want to work with, you know, it's like over lunch or at, you know, uh, at a bar or wherever, you know, you may chat up a friend to start working on something. And I find anyways, half of what gets me to stay committed is mo like sort of excitement and uh, morale. Um, and a, a great way to keep morale up is to have there be people that are excited about it. Mm -hmm. So you know, in a demo, you can get into the weeds on fixing bugs, frustrations, all the things that come along with that. And But it's, you know, to have, you know, like I said, w w for at least for myself, I think Tim and Chen as well, like we make games for ourselves, but also for fans and, and people that like to play games. So having that support, even if it's just people, you know, sending you likes and, you know, whatever. Now there's Discord, a bunch of other new cool ways to be able to converse with fans. Um, I found that this, I mean, when we made it, you know, I, I think I may have even been sort of grumpy about making a trailer. Cause I think Chen was the one who's like, we got to do something. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I look back to it now and I'm like, that was the right thing to do. And so I actually usually tell friends like, why haven't you made a trailer yet? 
Mm. And they're like, oh, we have to finish the build and make it playable so we can show. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, get what you know you want the game. And then that get, helps also create the scope of, well, what what do we want to have in the game? Because if, you, if you're making a trailer, you're gonna, you should be showing what are the most important parts of what your game is. Um, yeah. And that, in a way, can help frame and scope your demo, too. I, I would I say this is, that this advice is gold right here. I would say stuff. that the I would say that the trailer is good, but you can also do animated gifts and put those online. Yeah. See how much reaction you get from that. Yeah, that's even it's even it's the better. same sort of thing, it's just in a shorter context and quicker to do. Yeah, there's that one guy. I don't where there's a couple they're on they're they're using Unity. Uh the the cat ping pong ball one I've been watching. I don't know if you guys have seen those those gifts come up. It looks freaking sick. And it's this person is like delivering updates to the point where I'm like, all right, I just want to play the game. Just send it to me. <laughs> like I just want to where do I buy this thing? Like the, I'm the, sold. It's cat thing for the future mama see throwing any, money at the screen. <laughs> I actually really love that you mentioned that. Um I mean, like you said, all of you have worked at AAAs. Um I think like uh, previous developers that we've talked to as well has talked about like, you know, a lot of people have this thing where you graduate from university and you're like, I want to be a game designer. I'm going to work at all these huge studios. And it's like, guess what? You might be working on a game for six years and then yeah. they cancel it and you never get to talk about anything you did. Uh, <laughs> That's the perk of, of an indie developer is that you actually get like it. It sounds like, oh, my gosh, right away. you don't want to talk like, oh, my gosh, as a developer, you don't want to sit there and also be the community manager and the marketing person. But that's the perk. Like you build an entire community. And based on how excited yeah. people are in chat right now and the fact that some people are mentioning that they were around when your first trailer came out and they remember it and watch your streams. I think you, fans here in chat. you built a really, really good community <laughs> of people here that really are dedicated to your game. And how long has it been now that you've been developing? I think somebody oh, just asked that God. question. You said oh, Unity God. 4 or 5 you're working on, so it's been a while. <laughs> uh, six years, seven, six. Mm -hmm. I, Let's go with six. That sounds better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> technically, it was we'll just a warm up, the, right? <laughs> we'll go. Let's just like the Kickstarter. If you go from this Kickstarter, it, we are rounding. We are now five years from the uh, since okay. the Kickstarter because that was July of 2016. And that's, that's about when we went full time. Just that's before that. Yeah. Oh, that's, okay. We had been full time January previous. That's when we moved up to Seattle. Yeah. Because I was like, Seattle's cheaper. Ha ha ha. So <laughs> cheap. That, that literally lasted about like six months. And now it's like, oh, forget it. Uh, and, yeah. and, and we'll so talk about that. that Kickstarter trailer soon. But for, uh, there's one thing I want to talk mm -hmm. like one point you brought up that I think was so key is you mentioned that, you know, you, you didn't just put out the trailer to, you know, market the game, but also to motivate the team. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that's underrated, right? Like maintaining that motivation for yourselves. Uh, was there a lull at any point? Just to, you know, to, to get real for a second. Mm -hmm. Was there a lull in motivation at any point? Did that happen? Was that really, did you feel like you really needed that push to keep going? I don't, I mean, this is, I can't remember to be honest. I know, I know mm -hmm. I was pretty bummed out at the full-time job I was at. So because, and this is, I think, how most side projects start is that the employee or whatever is, I, sometimes it's in crunch. Like if you're crunching at the end of a project or it's so funny, like you'll start a project and you'll be like, I'm working on this great space game. I love space. Space is the greatest thing ever. And like four, the four year mark, you're like, I hate space. And you're like, <laughs> I want to make. And so now you're so making true. <laughs> on your on the side, you're making yeah. your Lord of the Rings game, or you're making your Elven Fantasy Quest mm -hmm. um, right. with Mini Hands DLC, and so like it's those <laughs> those types of things. That, <laughs> Shout out to the Tiny Hands! Oh, <laughs> uh, you knew I was gonna I was gonna sneak uh, it in there. Uh, sneak it inside. There we go. <laughs> Oh my God, we, uh, look at our numbers, you. Brian. Our, 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 uh, our audience so, numbers are shooting up. So creepy. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, but I mean that. It, it, I mean, so at least for this, I was elated. Like I was always excited about this project. But I think I don't know. I mean, how I. I mean, this is a long time ago. But the way I remember it was, I think we had been developing it for so long. Yeah. Uh, because Chen was like, we need to do something to get interest. And I think it was yeah. more like, are, what are we doing? You know, yeah. we've spent nights for a while on this. And I think maybe that would be almost sort of the uh, 
sort of reality check that Chen was giving us, having yeah. done that full project before that just literally you know, died upon release. I mean, it was just like it went out, we're like, we couldn't market it, we couldn't do anything. So I think um, that, I don't know if it was really a morale drop as much as it more was just like, well, I want to finish the game. You know, we always wanted to finish the game, but it's like, we need to make sure that there's interest. And so, yeah, at least in that, in that scope, it was, um, I think there may have been a lull like on the Wednesday night that I released that, you know, the trailer went up and I was like, no one likes it. No one's saying anything. And that can be depressing right. um, for any developer where you, you know, you're so excited, but it'd be better to have that sort of sense or at least failure happen earlier. They, there's that saying like fail fast. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it holds weight in the sense that no one wants to dump years. I mean, like you were saying earlier, Kara, like six years on a game to not be able to talk about it. I mean, that, that is like, that is soul crushing, like to, mm -hmm. as, as any mm -hmm. developed type of developer, like on any level, like if you're, on, even in marketing, you're waiting for that game to be done so you can start your marketing campaign, or at least nowadays they start marketing, I think, even earlier. But in the old days, it used to be like very quiet until, you know, in, you know within a year of launch, they would maybe start to actually ramp up. Um, and to have those people who may be on the team full time to just have to be like, well, I can't talk about it or, you know, it didn't go anywhere. And so it's just, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I'd say that trailer was for us a morale bump more than anything I, I would say for me that it was i was ready to dive in full time but i needed something for reassurance yeah and like that's what i kept talking to you guys about I'm like i want to do this i want to go full time but it's like we needed just we needed to know it would work yeah we needed to know people were interested that's yeah. true that's true because we did have metrics i think after that happened um after the video went uh <laughs> viral we i remember i think i threw out numbers like we need to have x number of facebook followers and twitter like we to make sure before we did a kickstarter because we were trying to figure out you know we wanted to do uh crowdfunding we wanted to be sort of no publisher and do this ourselves that was just in i think pretty much in all facets we wanted to make this our own way having done it all these other ways that um uh, and seeing our friends, you know, we had, uh, I had a good friend of mine that I helped start up, uh, the game Grim Dawn. And he, I remember pushing him to do a Kickstarter and Kickstarter was like, this is before Tim Schafer blew it up with, uh, broken, broken age, er, age. Thank you. Um, and after all those ones, and I was like, dude, we should do something. We should do something. And then that sort of helped solidify that. And by the time we came around, uh, what's that game? The one that bombed. That like oh god it was Make like even oh. anime kids can yeah. do I mean, it's like they just had the worst uh mighty number no. nine and so that yeah. literally oh, yes. was like came out right before we were going to kickstarter and that was like the et for mm -hmm. game development it was like oh god <laughs> like it so we were having to defend, the kickstarter audience yeah we were having to defend yeah pretty much I, I i felt that anyways um i think i think now kickstarter's changed a bit for how people look at it and how they come to it. now they usually there's there's much more stable like have a demo have like all these things ready to because now streamers will you know take a free demo play it and help you know and it's there's a lot more um i don't know there's just it's just more um what's what i'm looking for uh mature as a sense of how people go about a kickstarter and i would hope yeah. that on the same side kickstarter backers understand it's not it's not really, I mean, it's a pre-order. I think some people look at it that way, but it really is like, we're, a, I, I, even though we've been doing this for years, we're still new as a studio and bound to screw up and <laughs> bound to make uh, wrong decisions as much yeah. as we make, try to make right decisions. So, um, um, I'm babbling, sorry. No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that the expectations around Kickstarter have changed like over time uh you can't just show up to kickstarter with just an idea anymore I mean, yeah. you could but i don't think it would go down very well for you if you, if you were to do that anymore but um definitely on that note i'd love for us to play that the kickstarter trailer that you actually had because it was different than the original announcement trailer. Yeah. it was a new trailer you had prepared and then after playing it we can talk about the inspiration behind that trailer yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That sounds so good. let's cut to, let's cut to that trailer too So the 
Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's just amazing. So how much time between that original announcement and this Kickstarter trailer and what was the inspiration behind it? Uh, so that one, we... That was about, I'd say like six to eight months because we released... Mm -hmm. So when we released that first trailer, it was like in October or I think October 15th, which we didn't even know, I guess, was like the same week on the 10 year anniversary that Shadow Colossus was released. We had no idea. I mean, we knew it was getting to be around the 10 year mark. Yeah. Um, but we had no idea that uh, when we put out that first trailer that and that's why I think a lot of people that were because there is a massive cult following on Shadow Colossus for good reason. I mean, yeah. they're still trying. I mean, I'm in a lot of those discords and it's pretty awesome to watch um, how, uh, I don't know, how much love they put into just trying to figure out what was going on, I think, in the developer. Because they're always picking into the levels, trying to find some secrets, I guess, or, or new content. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, between that time and, and uh, that trailer, you know, we had moved, we had um, spent some more time trying to figure out uh, our tech and making that a bit better actually having a full playable demo that we at the time didn't want to put out to the fans because we were terrified that it wasn't going to be good enough or that it would show badly i mean demos typically for developers are something that are kind of double-edged sword like you spend time on it it's sort of throwaway in a way because a lot of that content doesn't really get used in the final um because a lot of it's sort of ad hoc to just get it to work um and then you're sort of you know it's forever out there in, in in some cases so people then could judge that as sort of what the game is you know even though years later it's it's better so we were scared in that regard to make a demo but we did make one to go shop around when we had our start our kickstarter so when we made the trailer there was a number of things that we knew we wanted to have um and show but like i said we showed the giant what we call now the krogon but like that was a very early version of it and uh I mean, that was pretty much like a, a hope and dream really at that point. Like we had known that we could make it work um, and we had some ideas. I had some ideas at least how it could play. So we had shown sort of like, well, it'll swing its tail around. It'll land on the ground and do these different things. Um, but the overall trailer cut, like when, the, when we did the first trailer, um, and this is also just sort of a tip, I guess, to other indie devs is look at movie trailers. So we had looked at a bunch of, because movies do it this, you know, every day right i mean it seems like to before you know you make a movie you make a trailer or at least they recut the what they've shown to make a pitch or something so um we looked at some of the trailers and one of the ones that i always still even though the movie was okay but i really liked it was prometheus and that had this great section that um had this kind of these these breaks that just kept building and building and building in intensity and the hair on your neck would would kind of stand up um and so we actually just cropped that and our first take of our trailer, we uh, cut it to Prometheus um, and put the videos. And I think you could probably sync it up actually, and it probably would work. Um, yeah. And so our, my, my good friend, Ian Dorsch, who's the uh, our composer, um, I've known him since college, as well as the sound designer, uh, Dan um, Chrislip. I've known him since college. We all sang together in college and so we were in choir and i had a music minor and so all this other okay. stuff so uh i um Didn't asked know about I, that oh sorry so i <laughs> i cool. uh i pinged him and said hey uh you know here's this trailer what do you think he's like wow that looks really cool and i'm like so can you know he was gonna he had helped on the, that kingdom commander project i mentioned too um they both did and so i said hey can you uh help with this project and this is this is the the trailer we're looking at and he's like, cool, yeah, so what do you want me to do? I'm like, well, I need you to match this. And he's like, wait, how, I can't, like, write a music. That's, that's why I think, like, the music from the first one's so different from the rest is because he was not the happiest. It's like, hey, amazing composer, like, here's a paint by numbers, like, make music by numbers and to match these beats because we really liked the timing of it. And it was already, re we already kind of synced all the video and everything to it. So he tried, he, he made it. Great. And then Dan at the very end put like this very hint of her screaming, which really makes it intense. Um, and so with the second one, we wanted to, he wanted to move a little bit away from that. And we wanted to be a little more self-indulgent, I think, not in a bad way, but in a good way, like to really show what we could do um, both artistically and musically. So uh, that's his wife singing in the beginning. Um, she's an amazing operatic singer, um, Joy. 
uh, isn't Joy um, Dorsch is her name, um, and uh, known her as well for years. And um, he got her to sing that beginning part, and that's him as well singing. I think it's a duet. Um, and so he wrote all that music, and we and we at first had it sunk to most of the music, and then we also by the end kind of went back to the Prometheus to get that beat because it had a nice has this nice build. So he struggled a little bit with it, but he killed it at the end. Um, where and then we sort of retweaked it a bit to make it that she falls. And for the longest time, we were always having her sort of almost Aeon Flux style. If you've ever seen that um, uh, cartoon, I guess you call it cartoon from back in the day, Liquid Television made this show called Aeon Flux. And the woman was kind of badass, but she'd always die in the end. And I always thought that was pretty cool, like where she's, you know, the, it would always sort of flip on itself. And so part of the loop we were tr trying even in game development that time was sort of this, uh, you you know, not rogue light, but like, so like a survival game, sometimes you would die, and you, you know, you try something and then you die and you try. It. And that was sort of this vibe we were going with at the time. And so a part of that was um, one of the early design ideas we had was this wolf would pull you back to like your last spot that you died. And so that was what was kind of going on here was the wolf was you had died from the previous one, right? So the trailers were actually in a way could be looked as being chronological. Um, and then with this one though, what's cool about it is that it can also in itself look like a loop where she's being dragged in the beginning. And then, um, at the end she falls down and the wolf goes to grab her. And then if you see throughout the wolf's dragging or doing all stuff, so there's a lot of this play that we were having fun with, um, which were intentional actually design ideas we were trying but then when actually when we got it in it was actually kind of boring to have that <laughs> not boring <laughs> it just was like I mean, we had it literally where the wolf would be pulling you and you'd see it from that camera and you could move the camera around and it was just like uh i'm gonna skip this you know like it's like a lot yeah. of yeah. those types of things the player just wants to skip it so we opted to shift that more into just cutscenes that we would show less being actual gameplay type thing because it just i think it became more the idea was cool and to use that more as a narrative piece than as a game design solution so um but yeah that that trailer uh also did really well for us and we used it for the for our kickstarter um and we really wanted to push i think what i think a lot of people were questioning about when we did our first trailer like is this just you know uh in the sense of, like of um it just bosses so we showed like the wraith which was that character that sort of flies at you um i think we showed uh i think we showed a little bit of crafting at that point because we were also starting to get into crafting i don't think we'd shown a lot of, i'm trying to remember that trailer it's, we just saw it but my brain's already wiped but um i don't know if no, there's crafting in that trailer i think I we may have showed it during our kickstarter like just a little uh, yeah. animated gift. Okay, I think you're right. Yeah, but at that point, that I mean, that was a lot of that. Oh, when she's walking through the snow, that's right. That's like straight up from the actual demo that we showed. Because um, yes, like yeah. Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, they all reached out and we talked with them, and um, it was uh, it was pretty cool um, getting to to talk. I mean, because we still are obviously releasing on consoles, so we've made some great contacts over the years that we still are still talk with them to this day um but uh yeah i'm babbling so please no worries <laughs> no. i thought it was we nice uh, in chat somebody uh, somebody named chapter 13 said a husband backed the kickstarter because he knew how much i love shadow of colossus uh so i think that like, a lot of people have been following you for so it's been three four years since so like they've been mm. following you for thank a while you. there <laughs> thank you for your patience thank you. <laughs> yes and, thank you and uh thank you for your support i yeah. honestly when we do pax things we'll have Kickstarter backers show up. I mean, PAX, you know, before COVID, obviously, um, was a great way for us because we're in a way local on the Seattle side that we could do PAX West. Um, and it was always cool that we'd get occasionally a Kickstarter backer show up and, you know, uh, that was the best. Like any fan, it's awesome. But for someone to g basically take a risk like that, and some people took, I would say like, uh, you know, I'm tight with the buck. I try to be, and I, you know, I was really surprised that people felt that committed, um, for what they had seen to, to back us. Cause I know it can be risky. So, um, I really appreciate that. Like it Kickstarter backers. I mean, I are honestly like, I don't know. I feel like family in a way it's like, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, if, if it's okay, I try to say, hey, can I hug you or at least give you a high five? Like, thank you so much. <laughs> 
uh, we'll take pictures with you, whatever. Like, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Linod's in the chat uh, says, ask Brian about his band. Seriously, ask him. Oh, God. I asked Chat to... <laughs> I asked Chad to go find the videos of you singing in college, so I'm still waiting for. <laughs> I'm still waiting for all the internet you stalkers. Drop that in the chat uh, <laughs> to go find it. God. I think I made. Sh this is before I, the internet can forget things. I think the internet has <laughs> thankfully forgotten those things. They may find we'll a photo them. here or there, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I was ahead of my time. That music was just misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Uh, uh, so going on from the from the Kickstarter trailer, um, I guess many years later, uh, you ended up with another trailer, uh, like in 2019, when the early access version of the game was released, right? Uh, so for many people who don't know, this game was actually... Was the intention to always go to early access? Or was the plan to release no. it fully? So, so when we, yeah, so when we did our, our Kickstarter, we had originally said hey well we knew we could do about five bosses i felt like okay five bosses would get us what i call like the, the key rigs right because mm -hmm. rigs are probably you know if we get really in the development side of things like you want a biped rig quadruped rig some some sort of like flying rig and uh maybe like a i think like a serpent or something right because you can make that in the water you can put it in the yeah. air you, you know like a you know, the air dragon or something like that so like those those i was like we can get those five ish rigs set up, we can then, you know, use and reuse some of those parts um, and change design, et cetera, and make more enemies from that. But at least at the very bare minimum, we can deliver that. And so we also added, though, an additional uh, stretch goals because um, we really tried that one of the big things was getting the number down to where it looked feasible. Um, and, and, so because with Kickstarter, it's all or nothing as well. So we didn't want to fail on our Kickstarter, which can kind of be a kiss of death. Um, not always, but it can be. Uh, it, it can be, a, a in a lot of ways, a, a drop in morale around the team. Hey, if people aren't going to back us, then no way a publisher is going to back us. Because that's for a lot of people. They'll do a Kickstarter, get money, then go to a publisher. We were like, no, this is what we're going to. There's no publisher that's going to give us money at we, we want to take this money make the game and release it mm -hmm. um and a lot of our backers were actually were console backers that we found because we we most of the time they'll usually have consoles sort of like as, as stretch goals we had them as stretch goals but that somehow upset and i understand now i think looking at it because we were saying well if you back at this price we'll also release it on console so there is this issue early on in our kickstarter where people were like well i'm backing it for console but it's a stretch goal so then we were hearing people like, well, I'm just going to pull out if it doesn't get close to that. So that was really nerve wracking. And so I remember we had dev kits. And so I told like Chen, Chen did the PS4, like a quick port PS4. and Tim yeah. did yeah. sort of a quick port to prove, okay, we're not lying. It's working on console. So we'll just make that no longer a stretch goal, but we'll release that after uh, we finished the game because typically when you do a port, most of the time a company will, uh, like a smaller company will finish the game, release it on Steam, make some money, and then either pay for the port or have the publisher pay for the port. Or sometimes they'll do it at the same time, but they'll have a, a third party making the port while the develop, main development team makes the game. So I was at least trying to approach it like a non totally nutso way of doing it. Um, and when we were getting close to finishing up the five bosses, I was like, I really want to do these stretch goals. And we were looking at sort of what we could accomplish and the game felt good. But, um, I, like I said, my friend who did Grim Dawn went to early access and filled out an additional two kind of chapters to the game. And it, it while in early access, the game just got better. And so I looked at it as like, well, what we can do is Tim and I were doing most of the content, most of like the gameplay stuff while Chen was always deep in the back end of like physics and a lot of sort of the overall architecture of the architecture of the game. He did open world within the first month of us getting our Kickstarter um, campaign successful. And so that was a huge undertaking even then because Unity didn't really have an open, uh, open world mechanic. Uh, the pathing and everything else was not really set up for that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when we went 
made the decision to go to early access, it was, I would say, about a year or so prior, I was sort of beginning to ring the bell, like, hey, maybe we should do this. I, I could see how it could work. And then we could do these sort of stretch goal bosses. And while we're doing that, we can work on the consoles at the same time. Chen could. So we would kind of split already three people team down to two doing the content side and one doing uh, the console ports. And that uh, started out well, um, but it certainly gets to be very tricky when um, you're having to optimize literally while you're making the game. So you'd finish a boss and you have to go back and optimize that or you find, Chen would find some new uh thing that we were like cloth was one thing that that just complete and so these we'd have these i would almost call them disruptions in development where we'd have to kind of take us it was like two steps forward three steps back sometimes where we'd have to go back and completely re-architecture um gameplay type stuff to make it run because it we would use the cpu maybe more so than you would want to on a console um so you'd have to go back and i guess you you know however engineering does it to shuffle around what's being processed on game objects and everything else so um but but i would say early access has been a, a, a saving grace for us in terms of getting the game that we wanted to make but as well making the game before i think a certain subset of players um want to play and that was i think a big thing a, a big moment for at least myself and uh i think the rest of us to sort of understand like we were going in with a much more kind of hardcore mentality on, dark soul i love yeah, dark soul yeah, yeah you love dark yeah. souls i yeah i get yeah. that i am not a huge dark i mean <laughs> no I thought, Blo I thought bloodborne was cool but it's like yeah but we did have like people that like shadow colossus but really thought y y that's closer to dark souls and then there's also a shadow colossus group that's like no i love the exploration i just like kind of the chill out vibe that that shadow colossus has um and it's very you know cinematic and entertaining and so over time we, you know, I, I was a bit more, no, the game is about overcoming impossible odds. You know, you're sort of taking on these giants with nothing but even your bare hands. And that's sort of the arc that I liked. And I liked the tension that it built where you'd have these moments of like, uh, the storms could turn on you. Things could happen sort of at the drop of a, a hat. And so you could be in a boss battle doing one thing and then it all sort of changes up because of the storms. I love that. A lot of people don't like that. They don't want to be bothered with that. They like the snow, they like that, but they don't want to deal with what that can mean um, in the terms of their of their gameplay. So that was a big under, you know, I wouldn't say a big undertaking in terms of the back end of it, but to make that work so that they could easily understand it. Um, yeah. And that's if you see it in, even in games right now, that's happening across the board where I think a lot of games are, there's just so many new players now that come in and they all have different ways of how they want to enjoy the game mm -hmm. that you try to find that balance where you're not, you know, losing sight of what the overall sort of vision of the game is, but making it accessible for, um, for everyone. Cause in the end, that's like what I've said before, like we want as many people to be able to enjoy the game. And if it's this one thing is bothering you, or it's just not how you like to play a game, it's like controls. Like some people want to yeah. jump with this button versus that button. And that's, I think the yeah. easiest way to look at, um, how to make, how to make it work. Cause in the end, I, for me, it's like, do you enjoy the game? Great. You know, it don't care if you beat it on the hardest difficulty. It doesn't make you yeah. the better gamer. <laughs> it's like you, I, you finished it. That's like, most people don't even finish games. So congratulations. I think we went in a lot of it too. Like if we were trying to make it like one set difficult where it was just yep. hard for everyone. But mm -hmm. then we learned that like, er, like you said, everybody likes a different difficulty like a different challenge. And some people don't want to be bothered with anything except for the puzzle of Boston. And so we have the two difficulties that you don't have to worry about anything. You really just play the boss. Like, yeah. Um, you, the and, we, there from the, yeah, we still r run the gamut of like, some people really like the hardcore mode and they just yeah. want to challenge. Like, yeah, and that's the mode that I like to play too. That's, I, I side with Chen. I, I love Dark Souls. <laughs> I guess I guess for me I found it I found that more the, the kind of casual side of it more once we got into COVID because of just the stress of like I had my kids here I mean they got no schools so it was like online learning and just at the end of the day I was so exhausted that when I would play a game I just wanted to relax and enjoy it so I started playing like if games had like fishing mode. So I, my, my son at the time was like, 
hey, I want to play Fortnite. So he got us all to play because that was like, you know, his friend moved to the UK because they wanted to get out of I mean, long story. But anyways, they moved out. And so, it was, you know, he was sad about that. So they would play Fortnite together. We'd all play Fortnite. And he got me playing it. And I would just fish. <laughs> like You can like fish. And like everyone would be shooting. I'm like, no, man, I'm fishing. And I always wanted to like pilot helicopters and just like that I've not never heard get into the intensity of the battle. And like it would build all this stuff. And I'm like, my son's like, dad, you got to get better at your 90s. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like I'm just like so casual. Like I would pick, like buy a skin that looked cool and just sort of run around. And so like that was, I started understanding like there's a lot of people that are going having to deal with a lot of stress in their life and they want to enjoy this game in a way that they're not having to do more work or have more stress. Um, yeah. They want to be able to and just enjoy themselves. And so that was me in a lot of ways. And it, and uh, I mean, Tim and I had long discussions about like, well, what do we call that? Right. Or how do we, how do we make that so that the, you know, the player can still choose while they're playing to, to use the things. Cause what you don't want to do is take away everything and then, all these systems that you have in the game, you're, you're having to micromanage turning them on and off. So there was some discussions at quite a while for how do we make, so we made like this boost mode that was more about like the incentive because we had survival systems. And some people think survival means if I, if I stop eating, I die. And so we had to mm -hmm. really explain to people, no, 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 no. You don't have to eat even in the hard survival. It will just hit on your stamina regeneration. So like trying to make it where it's like, these are things that you can, you know, if you want to play a survival game, you can, because it will in, impact your ability to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, I find it to be fun in that regard. But I get how some people are like, look, man, I just want to, I just want to, I'd had a long day at work or my kids are driving me nuts or whatever. Uh, I just want to enjoy this game I, I'm playing. And so, um, you know, that was something that we worked on uh, quite a bit to get, uh, to get right where it still, like I said, has the, the feeling of of what we intend intended for the player to feel so things like cold and stuff you still get cold you still have those things they just aren't going to be um as brutal as i think they were before nice um just to go back earlier you mentioned that some stuff about the snow and like uh the weather system and stuff we'll actually go back go into that so if chat, a lot of ch people in chat ask questions because they were really curious about the technology the tech behind it and what chen and they were asking if chen was really proud of that i'm sure he'll talk to you uh, at infinitum about it so we'll, we're gonna get yes. to it in a bit we'll, later we'll really deep dive into it <laughs> yeah and as we will also get like get to you know you were talking about easing the frustration for players and i think when we're talking about the tools we're going to talk about maybe how some of those tools help to achieve that right specifically with collisions so that's a little yep. piece for later in the show <laughs> um but yeah so you know when you released an early access on steam you had that uh the early access trailer, right? So let's cut to that trailer now and, and see how different it was from the Kickstarter trailer. So that's the trailer three final. We'll cut to that.
Amazing. So Brian or anyone, or maybe you can talk to the uh, s- specifics of what you wanted to show with that trailer. Yeah. So, I mean, with this one, and, and this is a big difference when this one from the previous ones is we decoupled a lot. We decoupled off of sort of like how I mentioned, like the Prometheus stuff. Um, we were using, I think at this point we're using timeline um, mm-hmm. uh, a bit more. Um, we were getting our feet wet a bit more with timeline and uh, Tim had done, I think he did the first two and this one as well, I think was mostly like I would draw up things roughly. Tim and I would have a quick meeting and then you would set up most, if not, I think all these shots. Yeah. Um, you would basically direct everything I did as I was. So that, like, That's such it. a nice way of saying micromanage. Yeah. yeah uh, well, maybe not every. Come yeah. On. I, yeah do sort of like... I would do paint overs <laughs> a couple of times. But like, so, so we were very intent on, so a lot of these shots like this, we're trying to show uh, crafting. She's got the ax, the trees cut down. I mean, there's a lot in each shot that we're trying to show like, here she lights the torch to show that you can light things on fire. We're sh- this is the first time we're revealing that there's actual minions in the game and they burst out of the ground, like yeah. kind of randomly wherever you could be. Um, and that was sort of the original idea was that the sense of like at a moment's notice, you could be full health and everything else. And then all of a sudden these, you know, others are, don't want you there. And so join the grappling hook and everything sort of lines up. Right. So then she's climbing. We see one of the first new bosses that we haven't shown. Um, they were showing how there's puzzles in the game, and then that leads to the next boss. Um, there was a lot that went into this one. And surprisingly, it took, I, I think this one also took about a month. Um, yes, yeah. But it's been getting faster for us, for sure. Um, yeah. This one went, and most of where I think where the speed was faster for us was in the iteration times. Like that's where usually trailers or VFX or a lot of things that happen that are sort of the polish parts the iteration times can be like do or die really like and this was we were getting so much faster at doing things because of timeline um and uh i think this this trailer there's some cons to it i would say in the it was just a lot slower build than we've usually done um in that so that beginning shot like if i was to like critique it now with what i know and how much internet has sort of changed people's um, attention spans um, is that like, I would at least either try to have her in this first shot so that people tend to gravitate towards seeing people. They want to like photos as well. They usually want people in the photo. This was just sort of an environment shot and it was a slow pull. So steam started doing like six second trailers, right? This push for these like fast, 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 fast came right around about after about six months after we did this. And Mm -hmm. so we saw like this was on our steam page. But they talked about like how quickly people jump into a Steam page and how fast they go through it. So we realized this trailer was probably actually not, not even probably being watched as much as um, as most people would want to watch. Like even on Twitter, if you were to repost this, right, it's sort of the first shot is this long shot to just right. sort of this beam sort of bursting through the sky. And maybe if you were a fan of the game, you'd be like, oh, it's exciting. But if this is the first time you're seeing this, you're like, what is this? Like, I don't understand. I've spent 10 seconds of my life on this. I'm out. So, um, unfortunate, <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of like w- how as a team, we were able to do this, like it, things were becoming far easier for us to do things that I think if you look at the first trailer to what this is, I mean, this is insane. Um, in my opinion, looking at it, it's like for what usually a team of three could pull off, like, and we were able to do this with pretty much for the most part, a lot of tools that are already now in unity, it's pretty pretty awesome um could you talk about some of those tools that you think really made the difference sure uh i mean i i know for one uh timeline has been a godsend for us um in terms of how we did a lot of the cutscenes. and the fact that like it was like for a long time it, it was either tim was having to really figure out his own subset of tools to get a lot of this stuff to pull together which were good um a lot of a lot of it in the older trailers was me going into free cam, moving mm-hmm. the camera with one, usually with the keyboard, I think. And then on my controller, I was moving the character at the same time while recording. So trying to get the two movements to line up, which took a lot of just do it over and over. Oh, that's not quite right. Do it again. 
and then you know spend all night doing one that shot. Was Tim saying it wasn't quite right, not me. <laughs> maybe, no, and, maybe a couple of times. With me. You know, yeah, sometimes you. <laughs> Although I got that too. I know in a couple cutscenes you would say like, "Can you change this?" I'd be like, "Oh my god!" Ah. It was it was mostly your resolution. Your monitor is a weird resolution, <laughs> and know. it was never 1080p. It was like. 900 p or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> that drove me nuts. <laughs> but I'd say that, and then the uh, in terms of other tools, like you know, we were kind of first into on on Mechanim, which was you know like that was brand new to us back back when it first came out. Now it's like you know how else That's would you make older, a game without yeah. it? But like yeah. a lot of the stuff that we you know the the terrain changes that have happened. Um, how we shifted from uh, the pathing that Chen originally did, which was A Star, to yeah. um, Unity Nav Mesh. Oh my god! The, there was also within this trailer. I think I started using Machine to, to frame the shots. Oh, and that that's was, right. That's that right. That was really not nice to get to reproducible. Like I'd move the character, the camera would be with it. So that was always such a manual headache. Trailers. As soon as you move something, the whole camera's. Yep. Right. And just syncing yeah. syncing up sounds and everything else. It, you know, before it would have to be post post, but we could yes. actually do all that within timeline to, you know, like I said, iteration time, right? So you want to scrub things, scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, and then decide, okay. But literally, I mean, you could in a way hit play now without having to sit there and hit play and like do everything with the camera and the control, you know, which so manual that a one time take is literally that was the one time I don't know if I can perfect it again, but then we got to the point where we could turn on and off our snow and storms and do all that stuff um, with just saying, Hey, I want to do it versus like having to make, you know, magically make these things happen. We could reproduce them. Right. So at this point, it's safe to say, you know, you, three trailers in your trailer experts at this point, <laughs> but still there's one more trailer, right? Yeah. To show. And I can't wait to play this one. It's the trailer that's currently on Steam. Yeah. Right, right now. So let's cut to that. That's the Steam trailer. It's the one you may have seen in the beginning, but for anybody just joining us, you, uh, you'll, you'll get to, you'll get to see it. So Steam trailer, we'll cut to that. So yeah, behind the scenes, we were just talking about how I, I think it's incredible that the team does not outsource any of the trailers, right? Four trailers yeah. in and everything was made themselves. We don't trust other people. That's why <laughs> yeah. we do it all ourselves. Yeah. And other parts of it. We'll talk about that later too. <laughs> how much you don't trust other people. <laughs> uh, hard. Uh, and, and, and so th and this is not the end, right? There's going to be probably another trailer for the, yeah. uh, for the final release. So that's something to look forward to. Yeah. This, uh, the interesting thing with this trailer was uh, Sony had said, hey, you know, I think I was maybe asking for like, hey, is there marketing opportunities or something where they asked us like, hey, do you want to do a trailer? I, I can't remember who asked who, but... Basically, we needed to make a trailer. At that point, we had been working um, on the on the PS5 for a while, and um, as part of their request, you know, it it had to be recorded in the on the PS5. Like it couldn't be like, oh, this is PC and it's coming. You know, so we had to have all the tools um, available to be able to make this um, using a controller, using the DualSense controller. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the big things that are, that's in this, that's, uh, coming in the, what we call the V1 version, uh, and it's been requested is every, like right there, you can see her running by, 
um, every she's like running in sort of the cameras following the boss. So that's actually, you know, a lock on mechanic we have. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a cinematic lock on. We also have like a combat lock on now that'll be um, be released when when V1 releases. I, um, I would say this is the first trailer too, where every single camera is in game camera. Nothing yeah. was set up using mm -hmm. like camera tracks or anything. So it's no, it's all, all you just play in the game. Yeah. And so this was done in three days. And uh, I mean, now my, when I mean three days, it was like 72 hours. Like, I mean, mm. it was, I don't, I mean, I slept a couple hours. Um, yeah. And usually we'd have Ian write a very specific track for the trailer. And so I think that was part of what would take a while was making it really unique for that. This is actually a track on one of the boss battles, the new boss battles is coming. And I, you know, I had to, I was like, Ian, I was talking with him. He's like, I think I can write something. I don't know, man. Like, when do you need this by? And I'm like, oh God. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down with Tim and I'm like, I'm going to, you know, I don't, I think Tim was like, I think you were still sort of stuck somewhere, like either in Texas or wherever you, you know what I mean? Like we were all sort of, cause, cause COVID yeah. had, 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 had happened yet. Yes. No, I can't remember, but basically we were at the point where um, it had to be uh, me doing it. And so I'm like, oh God, because usually Tim had really done a lot of um, the the recordings for the trailers. And so... Uh, I don't know if I had a dev kit yet. I think that was... Because I, I have a, a test kit. And so yeah. um, it had to be pretty much all available. Like, from like, a, like a test kits are usually like a retail or close to like a retail kit. And so, you know, I couldn't couldn't really use debug keys so much. I mean, we built a sort of a debug version that allowed for, I think, some teleporting and some other things so I could get to these bosses without having to play through the game over and over and over again. Um, but uh, yeah, we were able to grab about a minute's worth of music that is really awesome and has this nice build. And then Ian did sort of like a radio edit over it i was like well let's treat it like a radio edit where you know like you'll hear a song that's cool on the radio and then you'll buy the album and like maybe the drum beats a little bit different or like they change a couple things and part of that's for i don't know why maybe a producer feels like it needs to be a little more popish for radio who knows but in this case it was just like hey as we're watching this for a minute like how can we really make it awesome and some of that's going to be now in the boss music um, cause we liked it so much and he was able to really focus and polish on those parts. But what we discovered is the, yeah, you see, she's running across the screen pretty much throughout the, everything's going from light to right, uh, left to right. And so that was a easier way for me to basically set up each shot is just kind of keep running from left mm -hmm. to right and just try to use the beats of the music to sync up new shots. I always, I, I'm a sucker for that. I really like things to land on beat. Um, and so it, cause it kind of helps you get into sort of a rhythm when you're watching it. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the big parts is that we had done a couple, uh, steam had sort of pushed and asked for like six second. We started to like, said the six second advertisement type thing that they were pushing. So we tried to make for every second, there's another shot and there's really no big, we used to do these big breaks of like kind of black silence where the music building, then we would show something and then it would take another break and then show something. We decided to cut all that out and just go boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. um, and this was probably as successful as our first, um, our first trailer. We've never posted it ourselves. We just put it on Steam and then let Sony push it, um, and then uh, we just like retweeted it. Um, primarily just because I was like, uh, I didn't want to like compete with their, you know, you know, I don't know how that in that regard. Um, and plus, I just was tired <laughs> so <laughs> like i said we're not great at social media i was kind of like ah i'll put something out i'm tired but um yeah this actually, was yeah this i actually was think a, that's a i think that's a actually good segue um actually into like some of the marketing you've done and like kind of the things you've built with community which is like hmm. you have added actually later on photo mode into your game and i think yeah. unexpectedly and i think that's part of the fun of game development and there'll be a lot of like these kind of things for, about your game but like that ended up being picked up by community you have a super strong community so it was like the perfect thing to give to them because they ended up being your marketing tool essentially yeah right? yeah that's um so photo mode was around the time actually right around the time when we started realizing we were going to be also developing on or allowed you know to be able to start looking at developing on the ps5 and so one of the things we looked at is like well we can probably bump up graphics somehow so we looked at um our rendering at the time 
and had realized just like because we had been through so many iterations um with unity we were always very hesitant to make the jump to newer tools because sometimes they're not fully yeah. fleshed out yet <laughs> and one of those things that we if you look at sort of the original trailer versus the now trailer um was our sky and 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 how we were looking at utilizing sort of lighting and the original lighting i think tim had put in a pretty um uh extensive sort of sky system that was like a day night cycle had you know it, had and it was it pretty had, like it, it was like based on a real sky model yeah. so as the sun would come up the, the lighting would change except it just got to be too much it, it didn't look like the game we wanted well that and was, i remember the the fog systems we had storms that would roll in and what was happening was this a lot of things we realized with like pr procedural generation means the edge cases and that's something we deal with a lot even in our tech as well like edge cases of climbing and stuff and so here you can see like the clouds and everything the sky actually looks pretty happy right it doesn't look very like this which is more like fog and this spooky eerie um sense of foreboding you know what's what is out there in this world and so for a while we were trying to get that sort of disturbed sky feeling um and it was proving to be challenging and then we were able to finally get something to work but we had to like rip out a bunch of stuff to get that the way we wanted and then over time it was just sort of like it was always moving these clouds were always shifting and moving but it was so subtle i don't think most people would really even notice that and um it was around that time is when we kind of said well let's just try a like a old school skybox instead and then sort of just have i think we use sky shafts for most of the the high points of where light's bursting through and that gives a sense of like you know when you see cloudy skies and sort of these god rays coming through it definitely gives this sense of like something bigger than you in a way like i don't know why but you just have this sense of um uh you know something trying to burst you know break through and that was something within this game right here this world is frozen it's being overtaken by the cold like why is that like what's happening and so when we look at this like the clouds and the, and the smoke or anything we still have sort of this um sky where you have sun sort of breaking through but the clouds and everything start to feel a little more uh disturbed and so we uh once we were able to get that in which is just a much more easier skybox it was able to allow us to then start playing more with sort of the hdr lighting and those effects and we started to realize wow like how when we look at sort of what the early access build originally was it was actually the colors were getting very muted and it was getting almost like a gray um that well at times in game can look really cool when you just look at it from a screenshot it's not as um colorful or as exciting i think as as most people would have preferred so we started creating um looking at profiles we started using color grading a lot and we came up with a bunch of different options and sort of decided which one's the best one to pick which one do we like and then we realized hey you know we started seeing other games i think like horizon did it uh i think well, shadow had one as well um yeah and, the new shadow yeah and so you know we looked at those features and realized like wow this is really cool um and and to expose those some of those features at least to the players so that they could also enjoy what what they're seeing and share those and we didn't really know how well it would go i mean we were i thought it was just cool just to be able to take some fun shots um but what was really surprising was to see sort of the uh imagination and sort of expression that a lot of our players had where they're i mean taking just a character that really we don't emote our player character very much like she has a couple of emotes and um or you know she'll kind of idle here and there but it's not like you know she's incredibly uh over dramatic or anything it's it's more about what you're seeing in the world and um yeah once we release that uh and and, and you can see here like this is using i think the dynamic what we call like the dynamic uh filtering um it everything looks much more vibrant and then we added back in shadows like a directional shadow for sort of high-end pc and sort of the high-end um consoles so we'll we should be able to to run with um these sort of real-time shadows which i kind of go against i and originally i didn't really like real-time shadows because it tends to start to look a bit gamish because usually in a cloudy environment you have more of a lot of bounce light. And so you have a lot of, like I was mentioning, I think in uh, earlier, like the old PS2 and PS3 games had this nice sense of like contact shadows of like AO lighting. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And Unity has sort of an SSAO feature that you can apply to really the whole screen. And that gave it this nice uh, bounce light atmospheric vibe. And that's still there. Um, and if anything, it actually looks even better now with the the post processing stuff we've added. Yes. Um, but as a you know, on, on PC, you can turn on shadows at in the open world as well as we have it in caves because we have like hard directional lights of like fire and stuff. So we want to make that um, work. And then on the character, we put like a light rig. So she has sort of a three point light rig that helps pull out some of the normal maps and um features in her hair and other things and we bumped up her hair so like a lot of things we did in early access just to be able to improve from where we started development we realized like you know games are progressing pretty quickly and so while we're not you know last of us two quality you know we're three people we have to work with what we have we were able to squeeze a little bit more on the visual side and in um knowing that that can be still seen within even on the ps4 original ps4 original xbox one can still harbor most of those visuals i would Um, say on the tech side of photo mode uh, in large part i think it came about because we were we had all these post processing effects before like in the older version of our game we had like multiple different assets or post processing effects which it became a pain to work with all the different ones but eventually we moved over to the unity post processing stack became a lot better and finalized and within photo mode, then I can just go in and access one one thing, like the stack directly. And so photo mode just like came from sort of that. Like- that, that is true, Tim. I, now I remember back like when we were in development, it would be like you would build something. And I'm serious, this happened because we were talking with Spotlight for quite a while from like when we first did our first trailer, they brought us in when we were living in San Francisco and we talked with them and they were like, is this really, is this all in 3d studio max? Like they actually didn't even think that we actually had built <laughs> yes, this. I remember, I remember that. that. And we were like, what? Yeah. And they're like, is this just all in 3d studio max? And you guys are just rendering it. We're like, no, this is in <laughs> unity. Like we're using unity. Yeah. I mean, it's an, it was an older version of unity, but I remember Tim would build out all these tools and then like we would talk with spot and they're like, Oh, actually that's coming out in like another month. You may want to try that yes. out. And yeah. so we would build it, implement it, and then it would be in vanilla Unity. And so, like, do we rip all that out? Like, Tim just implemented it, yeah. got these plugins to work. So part of it was sort of this juggling of us catching up or, or Unity catching up with, you know, however you want to look at it in the mm-hmm. sense of, like, development was kind of this uh, leapfrogging. There was, of, a, of there was a lot of work I did that is gone now. That's, I mean, a lot of stuff was <laughs> sort of wasted time. But it was a good learning experience. <laughs> I think what's what's funny here is that you surprised Unity with with how good your game looked, but then your own community surprised you with how oh, good yeah. your game could look, right? So maybe we can cut to your screen. Sh- yeah, let me share, uh, and you can show us some of the uh, photos that that the uh, that your community took in photo mode. Yeah, so these are. I you mean, ta- now there's talk a about. ton. There are a ton of photos. These are ones I just kind of grabbed. And I'm sure Discord community has actually seen some of these because one mm-hmm. of the, the, the users um, uh, posted it. But like this was the most recent. I was, uh, I don't remember where I was when I just like opened up my phone and looked at it. And it looks even better on my phone like because of how awesome I think phones screens are now. But it was like, holy crap, like that's our game. Like I have what? <laughs> but usually they got really creative with lighting. So most right. of the the... I would say artists that have been taking the screenshots use like they'll plop down a campfire somewhere and campfires have their own light. So they'll get like a warm light on the character. So here they're, I'm imagining they probably dropped or they're standing next to campfire, which is getting sort of the warm light over here. And then this is sort of one of the God rays we use to, to exp- tell the player without putting a big arrow on the screen, like where then the location of the next boss that you could go is. Mm. Um, and then they just sort of stood there and I'm like, what? Um, this is another shot, I think, to one of the other bosses. Like, these are all just like we could easily use these as screenshots in uh, on our Steam page or in yeah. marketing. Um, and and one of the things I'm still trying to figure out, and uh, Carol, since you're and as well as Hassan, like, if I were to take Steam pictures and just repost them on Instagram, like, I'm worried, like, can I put? Should I put their name? Like their steam, like, I don't know, like if someone's going to get upset, like, oh, don't, I don't want people coming to me, you know, and that's what I'm like, I want to share these because they're awesome. But I always get really nervous about someone being upset 
um on on usage so like uh but like I I personally think you know it's 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 your project but i so you can post screenshots from your game but it'd be greatly appreciated if you were to highlight your community members they would love it right right because uh, i've tried to reach out directly and i'll like send an out friend request and i get nothing back and i'm like so they don't like what does that mean like how do i so i don't know like you just if add I, them you could add yeah. them Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I would like we we have an Instagram account that I've never done anything with. I don't think we've mm -hmm. ever posted anything on it. Uh, shows you, like I've said, how awesome we are at social media. Um, <laughs> but these screenshots are like freaking amazing. Right. Um, like this is yeah, just unbelievable. Insane. You should do, uh, you should do a community is... highlight. Yeah, on your Steam, you know, like when you do like uh, we, a publish yeah, we, stuff. We did. Uh, we showed some of our updates from when we had like we i would take an original shot of what it looked like i took our old that's right i did our old steam pictures that we had and then showed how they look now with this sort of photo mode type uh processing but then i just said hey if you want and i i mentioned about doing it but yeah it'd be awesome to because have you done a so photo cool. mode competition yeah no, i haven't maybe yeah. mm, that's yeah, something be, you gotta do that'd be a good idea yeah 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 um <laughs> And, you know, probably by launch and then we could do yeah. maybe give them, I don't know, like we have little buttons and pins and stuff. I could ship something like yeah, that, I guess. Just which is a great, there, yeah, because chat's been asking for merch the whole time. So yeah, oh, they're like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I get the clothes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like literally next to me is the stack of freaking T-shirts and boxes that we have. Oh, there you go. Chat. I, have to, so. I have to make the art book and that's been the because I have to finish the which now they are done. But I want to finish the game first before I can do the art book. But because you guys asked to find a bunch of old screenshots, I found tons of old like concepts, all this stuff that I knew uh, nice. I knew we had. It was just a matter of me spending the time to drag it all up. But this one's really cool too, because it's like to show, to actually have this be playable would be very difficult. It's too dark. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. from a gameplay perspective, but like visually it's arresting. Like it's so cool yeah. how, you know, far they were able to push the shot. And granted, like, we have a roll so you can make the shot be longer, but this still works even in this sort of very, I guess you say Dutch camera angle. Um, and then, uh, you know, these are ones just, this one, this is an artist, uh, Lorian 97. And they were one of the first people that really dove into our photo mode and just like, I was like, what? Like that's, that's our player character now? Like, holy crap. <laughs> um, and it's just, you know, just the camera zoomed in and, like I was just shocked. This this is one from one of the artists. Oh, that's that incredible! They really that we talked with them about it. They're awesome. like, "Hey, could we add point lights?" And we've talked about that. There's some optimizational and issues with adding just adding it. I think so. It's something we haven't really dove into. Um, but maybe long, you know, post launch, we may be able to to implement that. But for now, uh, you know, the way they've been able to do it, yeah, is with like dropping a fire and sort of presenting themselves in that and then we've added like in the video i sent like we have a look at now so the player can like look at the camera a little bit and that'll be in v1 um but like shots like this are just like unbelievable so those are the ones i have but there's way 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 more that uh that i've seen on our steam page and even in the past that people had sent that were just like holy crap like wow so um and I would say from like, uh, if you can do it, if your game is uh, possible where it makes sense to do it, totally offer that for yeah. your users, like for your yes. players. Because it's even if you choose not to repost those things, they will share with their friends without it. I mean, because, of course, why wouldn't you? Right. So um, and Carol, we're, we're doing a stream on this topic, aren't we? Yep, we are. So next month, we're going to have a I don't know if I should reveal it yet, but it's going to be a super awesome stream uh, with the, our technical marketing team, actually, our developer advocates, and they're actually going to teach you how to create your own photo mode and oh, nice. uh, and play around in it. So you can check out yeah. that stream later next month. Good for that. Cool. cool. Yeah. So speaking of the yeah the look of the game, um, I know that the sky in the game went through some iterations, right? And the, like there was kind of a progression of the visuals when it came to shadows and the skybox, and you had to maybe switch to HDR to achieve this. And I think you have some images to show the difference for us and, and yeah. how that progressed. So, so like this is like, I mean, which is hilarious. And and you would ask, like, I think we had some old uh, pre-alpha footage, and that mm. was like shocking to see how far the game has come like we had yeah. tim i mean and, and china guys like when i played it like do you remember we had like the roll camera 
So it was like the yep. roadie run from Gears I of War. I remember that. Yeah. And so the camera would like follow the player. Oh, we were like, and we God. sent, we thought that was so cool. And we sent that out and people were like, I hate this. I'm going to throw up, get rid of <laughs> yeah, it. It's making um, me sick. Like, and we thought it was cool, but it's like, yeah, okay. She's running all the time and it was doing that. And just and so it, much. It would, it would roll too when the, when the weather would get really bad. So it rolls oh, sideways. That's right. Sort of like, oh no, it's getting really scary in here. And, um, but so, we had a bug where that would get stuck sideways and people were just playing with the camera sideways. That They're was like, when this is how it's supposed to be. That's when Jack Septicai <laughs> got turn it. their yeah. monitors and yeah. he was playing the original build when we sent to him. And his, yeah. he like literally played it sideways. And I was oh like, my oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> what a, that guy's awesome, by the way. That guy, is, <laughs> Sean's so cool. He visited us, at, came and visited us at PAX. Um, and he had a little hoodie on because he obviously didn't want to be like the crazies to like jump all over him and be like, ah. And I was just like, oh my God. And, you know, he came and visited and said hi. And I've chatted with him multiple times, even this year. So like he's. <laughs> I mean, that guy is legit for sure. Very, very cool That's guy. Awesome. Um, nice to hear. But, you know, sky, Skybox stuff here, like this is some old concepts. But like what you can see is the sky. And I know, I mean, I think Tim, uh, when we were, when I was grumping about this, they'd be like, oh, the sky is not disturbed <laughs> enough. And he's like, I'll work on it. I need to, I'm trying to get this other stuff done. But he trying was to so make the game work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're just worried about the sky. It's important. <laughs> it's over 50% of the screen. Um <laughs> But like, uh, you know, some of these things like so at this point, it was always this pinky, like always bright looking sky. And what was hard was you'd have no clouds and then all of a sudden a storm's hitting like that doesn't make sense. And so I was sort of grumpy about that. And I wanted to see more clouds and in a way that it felt sort of like set foreboding and eerie. So we shifted to something more like this was this is actually real time. Like these clouds were always sort of changing. But the problem was that with this kind of a sky is it did we had to push back a lot on our colors i, I can't remember i think it was to match all the blending because when the storms came in we would change uh lighting a bit and what we couldn't get from these from this sky was those sky shafts like those weren't able to show i think we also couldn't reason. push the colors very well because of the procedural yeah. nature of how it was built the we couldn't like change the color the, we changed the whole color of the sky and that's it like yeah. it was very black and white. And yeah, this is like an old champion model that we had, but like, um, yeah, just so much of what was going on. And then the other thing too is uh, what, what you guys were talking about, what is that distance? Like where the fog is in the distance, it's expensive. Cause I remember you had it in Tim, but Chen's like, no, 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 we can't do that. Oh, oh no, but that was a lighting thing. Uh, you remember like where the back, called. The background would be the same, like like. So you can see here the uh, the mountains in the background would match the color, like, and that's atmospherics. Like that's that's a thing. Atmospheric that you, scattering. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah. Yeah. Too expensive. No. Yeah, and then I had to rip it out. <laughs> yeah. So we had that in there, and this was like. So one of the other things too is we were trying to figure out how do we make. Um, the sky show like we call like tears in the sky where the next sort of uh uh boss would be and so we looked at different options one was sort of a swirling thing but that also got weird because if it's swirling and we're doing a day night cycle and the clouds are coming through like it's going to be this weird floating thing in the sky so we shifted more i think it's the brain to this which is actually sort of a, also mm -hmm. a throwback to shadow classes a lot of things we do or i mean People are like, oh, you're copying them. And it's like, well, it's it's more of like, an, uh, um, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Like, an homage. Uh, yeah. Like, we're, we're, we yeah. want you to notice that. Like, it's on mm -hmm. purpose. It's it, in some ways, it's kind of tongue in cheek. But at the same time, it's like a lot of people were expecting that. Like, they, they, yeah. and to some ways, they actually are, there's, like I said, that subset of players really want to play the game as if it were sort of either a sequel or some sort of mm -hmm. prequel or whatever to that game. So we want to be understanding that, but as well, like we could have just made the game like that. And I think that would have also been a disservice to, I think where we would like to go or try and, 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 and push these mechanics in the future. So it's like, you know, for us, it was like, all right, we can get this to look good and work. Um, especially on the sky side, it was, uh, 
you know, like to get from here, right, where it's like super bright to this, it's weird because the storms come on so fast. And so that was like my, like I said, like my big grump that I was having. But I, I think there's some beauty in the sense that you have, you know, these different shades of sky, which are certainly nice, like sunrise, sunset. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we didn't do that. And we kept it with like this blue kind of, um, uh, you know, eerie color that, that I think uh, worked out really well in the end and so i don't actually have any final images of that unfortunately but you right. can see from these two and then we wound up going with just a skybox a much more simple mm -hmm. skybox that allowed us to blend in and out and then also fine tune um fine tune uh the overall uh like lighting a bit more it gave us more control really uh, you mentioned, um, you know, like the references or the homage to Shadow Colossus, but I mean, Stardew Valley is a game that was like a complete copy of <laughs> Harvest Moon has become mm -hmm. its own community genre people. Yeah. It's like, you know, years of content. That game is like a total hit, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, like, that's why I was mentioning, like, I worked on Titan Quest at the time. That was my first game that I worked on, like legit hired, paid to make and work on. And that was, I mean, we all love Diablo 2. Like I barely passed college because of Diablo 2. And um, so we were always very much, you know, we knew what we were making was a game for people that wanted the next Diablo because Diablo 3 took a long time. And, you know, to some would say that, um, you know, when it came out, people called it Diablo clone. We kept trying to say, no, we're making a genre. But at the time, that's what people called it. Then Torchlight came out, and then suddenly the term Diablo clone shifted and started becoming ARPG. I mean, it's like when we used to call things Doom clones, right? Like, we don't call Call of Duty a Doom it's clone. Yes, It's an FPS, right? Yeah. So this is sort of the same thing. And it was cool, actually, when we first did our first trailer, people were like, oh, it's a ripoff. Oh, they blah, blah, blah. I remember this one guy was, like, adamant in our YouTube thing, because this is when I still actually would read every single comment I could ever find. That's uh, unhealthy. That's yeah, not super a good unhealthy thing. Habits, but I mean, yeah. we're, we're trying to figure it out. Uh, I, still, I still try to read most comments. Sometimes I, I just roll my eyes. And other times I'm actually very interested. Like if there's someone who has a bug, I, I desperately try to make sure I can figure out what the problem is for them. But in, in this case, uh, 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 one woman made a, a YouTube thing and she talked about like, this is needs to be a genre. Like quit you know what we why can't we only have one of these types of games like i love yeah. this type of game plan i want to see more of it so that was the right type of thing and and if it winds up you know if we have to be called a shadow clone or if they colossal whatever like i'm fine with that i just want to see as as both an artist and a someone who plays games i have always told people even in our discord like i would be happy making this type of game for the rest of my life and that's one mm. of the reasons why when we went you know in as a company together that was you know, usually if you go in with a publisher or something else, you lose IP, you lose um, creative control, or you lose the ability to even talk to your fans. Um, those, all those things have, depends on the publisher, depends on the deal. But, you know, having watched my friends uh, that worked on Subnautica, having worked on my friends that, that worked on Grim Dawn, we're all very successful and for the most part, wholly independent. Um, they're able to keep making those types of games that they want or take that tech and put it somewhere else. So, um, you know, that's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine with people being upset with us if they are, I just hope that they understand, like, it's not coming from a bad place or we're trying to make some, you know, cheap variation. It's like, we're definitely, it's a labor of love, like the amount of effort and hours and, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> stress oh, yeah. and all those things. Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, you know, taking, like taking the risk to do it, to self publish, to do it on your own. Uh, and we'll also take a look at more of the tools that went into making the game. But first, we're going to go on a short five minute break and we'll be right back Perfect. and we'll jump into the tools that, uh, that went into making this game. All right. Thanks for everyone. Stick around. Stick around and uh, we'll be right back. We'll get your snacks. We'll get some snacks. Hey, everyone. And we're back. I hope you had a nice break. Um, I see that chat is still very active. So thanks for sticking around. So we're here with the creators of Pray to the Gods. Um, welcome back uh, to Brian, Tim and Chen. Uh, this time around, we're going to talk about um, all the tech. So this is really what you guys came for. Um, the really <laughs> deep dive on all the stuff that Chen has built to make this game look the, the way that it does. Um, so how about we start off like, the, you know, one of the 
most uh, one of the most like uh, the biggest like mechanic that we noticed like right off the bat is like all the climbing. You can climb everywhere. Um, maybe Brian and, and Chen, you guys can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think we have video for that. Yeah, too, we can pull just, up. Yeah, we can pull yeah. up the collision yeah. area painter. That yeah. So created. I know going into it, uh, you know, one of the big things that uh, you may see other games do where the character may climb on a, on a surface or something usually is like a simple collider, like a box collider or like a capsule. But for a game like Shadow Colossus or like our game, Pray for the Gods, like you are climbing a deforming um, creature, which really is like a level, like a fully deforming level. Um, and, uh, you know, Chen, uh, and you can speak this, Chen, but like it is not the same <laughs> it is vastly harder uh <laughs> yeah and the edge cases are pretty insane so 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 this two at beginning when we make the prototype you can climb everywhere on the bar right so but in shadow is it's like it's, it's a level you cannot just climb everywhere there's a limitation or, or somewhere you can go, you cannot. So that's why we made this tool for us to paint different area. Like, like you can see that this, like one, the main one is the climb area. So you can, when you click it, you can, like this is erased. The current one showing is erased, mm -hmm. or you can just like climb. The green one is you can climb, the, the gray one is you cannot. Yeah. That when you do the climb, but we still have like all different trigger area. It's the same thing. You just click on the trigger area, like you can name it differently in in, in our tool, and you can say, oh, like the arm is like like area, uh, right left arm, left arm climb area, or right arm, or like the hairy area depends on whatever that you want to name it. And that's how we know that player is on where. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you I'd might say, yeah. call to different things, right? On where the player is. Uh, yeah. So wh when 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 the player climb on on the boss, and it's all the triangle, and this tool make it so. Because each triangle have its own uh, index or something, and that's how when you do the ray casting, you know where you are on e on which triangle, mm -hmm. and the system will tell the AI or tell the system and say, "Hey, I'm on the I'm right now on the right arm, on the left arm, or whatever area you paint on," and the AI will react to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's also the camera system hooks up that to that too. So mm -hmm. we can paint on like left or right arm or legs and the camera can adjust based on where you are on the bot. Oh, nice. Everything is reacting to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so and so you had also mentioned uh, Brian earlier that like uh, this was very important to kind of s like smooth out like the frustration, right? Uh, and the way you set this up and the way you set up the grappling hook and uh, just the climbing mechanic in general, especially when it came to the flying boss, right? Because you didn't want players constantly falling off and it feeling yeah. frustrating. Yeah. So there's there's a I think originally we had like a grapple hook area that we were going to make paintable, and then as we got into the game a bit, it's like, well, you know, if the players just grapple hooking everywhere, they're not really climbing. And we need to, and plus it's weird to like, if you grapple hooked a boss, right? You literally stabbed it with something. It would probably react. <laughs> and so it's like, this doesn't make sense. Like from right. a, you know, believability type of a thing. And from a um, development side, like it's really, you know, important to be able to do this in engine versus um, like in, in max or something, just because you want to make sure, you know, the triangles are, are set up the way you want. And, and if you're doing it in, in a 3D program, it kind of only makes it available to me as the artist um, versus, say, Tim or Chen, if they want to go in and fix things or adjust things. So this tool allows it to kind of um, level the the development across the three of us to be able to go in and make changes and fixes versus 
you know, and that's one of the big things we've always tried to do with our tools is make sure it's like, try to make it as accessible, you know, while, while, yeah, I make the art or, or Chen does a lot of the engineering and Tim does a lot of the like tools in between those things, trying to make it as easy for any one of us to be able to use or at least, or at least be able to troubleshoot, um, was, you know, critical. And so with the grapple hook stuff, we did figure out it was probably easier to make, um, those be kind of spots on the character. So if you're falling, we can make it a little more easy to find them um, by we make them sort of we, now as iterative too. We had to make them kind of glow a little bit when you go in sort of like this slow mo. If you're falling, because falling is probably, I think, ten years ago, uh, players were a little more. Maybe that's like kind of goes along with the attention span thing. We're a little more willing to put up with falling or or, or failing. Um, nowadays, I think there's just so much games and content to play that the and the time spent that people have because they don't want to spend their time falling right they want to be spend their time yeah. you know uh succeeding so we try to make that um easier for the player so not i mean we're still gonna you're still gonna fall you still have to be you know in in the game in the sense like understanding what's going on but this this gives them those moments where they and you feel like a badass when you pull off i mean always even to this day i'll still be playing and you'll leap off and you can then sail cloth for well as this maybe a big flying boss came by and then slow-mo your grapple hook out and zip across and it connects and it just feels awesome. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, like I said, with this, this tool specifically, um, it, it really helped us, uh, identify, I think also like over time you start to see like where the character's going, how they're, how they're pathing on the character. And then, there's it, having that all like I, I want to say like itemized or in a way that like the, the triggering of, of certain things it's it's a very easy way to visualize how the game or how the boss may play out easier than um uh you know like i said before doing it all in the concept or a drawing or something you can really see and we would actually more more and more and more as we got further along with each boss blocking out things became far more of the a usual and that's something that like i think most game developers oh block it out block it out but we were in this constant work of like we have to show progress and 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 basically always be in a sense of pitching even um up to the kickstarter so like like i mentioned earlier in the in the stream like that the krogan boss like he never had a path like this he was literally just like i'm gonna make a cool looking boss and it should work and that took a long time to usually you you kind of make the shape through through primitives and other things and then you make a visual from that sort of that that shape you can do it i mean honestly there's no wrong way of doing it but in terms of like what's going to be the fastest and most game ready way you'd probably want to block it out um but even with this guy um the iterations on this guy um you, you like climb through his stomach and it's like totally like bizarre how you get around him and stuff. And that was all, you know, I just made static models to begin with and just set it all to climb. And then over time we figured out, then this tool came on. And so like it was, you know, in terms of when this tool came online, I mean, it was definitively like how we were going to be working from here on out. But, you know, it's, uh, um, it's it's interesting now i look at this now and remember back it's just like it's crazy to see like how we did it before <laughs> and yeah. this tool is like yeah. we couldn't have made the game without this tool i mean we could but it would have been a nightmare oh yeah <laughs> you're also talking yeah so you mentioned you know believability right in the mm -hmm. game and and in this game you know the, the, you know, it's a combat game you're attacking things you're destroying things you've also created a tool which for uh destroying objects Right, so let's let's cut to the yeah. auto simulate destructibles video, and maybe you can talk a bit about how you how you uh, worked around destructible object. Yeah, so I'll just talk quick, quickly about it because that's really Tim that masterminded that whole mm -hmm. system. But Chen was the one who was like, "This just came around." Uh, so we had, I th think, we had passed certification, or we were right. We were like through because this came pretty. I felt like this came later. In development for this us came a later later it, yeah. yeah this was pretty this was pretty recent yeah yeah and it's huge because so what we were doing originally if you look at any of the older videos we have lots of destruction bosses break things you, you can hide behind things and they'll break them you can you know all kinds of yeah, and the idea was that when we did these boss battles 
you can come at the bosses multiple ways. Yeah. Like if you look at Shadow Classes, it's usually kind of a one and done way of defeating that boss. We wanted the player to be able to go back and try different things. And part of that's changed over the scope of development. But like, ideally, it was like you could come with a bow and you could defeat him with a bow or you could come with a melee. And, you know, the, we wanted the player to feel like they had, they didn't have to have a one way of defeating these bosses. So a big part of that was having destructible items that were there for a while and then gone. Now you have to figure out another way of doing it. So we did all that real time. Well, destruction real time is a huge cost on CPU, which is okay on PC, but again, CPU costs tend to be pretty expensive on um, consoles because consoles tend to be a more a stronger GPU. They don't need a lot of backend. They're not running Windows, right? So they can mm -hmm. do other things. Um, but yeah, Chen put the hammer down. He's like, nope, it's, it's these destructibles <laughs> are the expensive. problem. And so oh, Tim yeah. and I went back and forth on how to do um, destructibles. And then I found like a random plugin or something. And then, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Like, you it, pretty much yeah, it was it. like a, a recorder from, you know, like a wiki or something. Right. And we were able to record animation while the game was playing. So just like keyframe animations from anything that's happening, moving throughout the world. Uh, so basically what the tool does is it destructs everything in real time in the game and then records that into Whereas before we used to have colliders on everything and it would interact real time in the world, way too expensive. So this though, like it would create animations and everything's assigned an animation. And then when a boss hits it, it just plays that animation, which is way more efficient. After that, we had to, we ran into a memory issue you know, because animations start to blow, blow the memory. So what we had to do was optimize them and uh that was pretty easy but after that it also came to putting them into addressables so that none of them are really loaded until they get hit and then the addressable loads it right away and explodes mm -hmm. so yeah this this tool was purely because of optimization like otherwise we would have kept the other way because the other way was honestly a little bit easier but this is way more optimized way better on but I would I would say that this new way is even better though because primarily what we were doing before with the real time explosions it meant that the assets had to be lower resolution because we were breaking those assets true true and those assets we thought would be cool originally to still have the colliders on it well that sucked players were getting stuck on these objects when you, why would you want to be climbing something that's falling we're fading it out how long can you collide with it most players just want that crap gone and uh, you know it's exploded I can't use true. it anymore. And what the problem that we were finding is when I, I went through originally, because it was on me to optimize it because we were going to make them animations. So I was having to go into Max and then destruct them to make them. And that's when we realized there's got to be a way to do this real time to record it because I'm going into Max. And then I had to make um, generic explosions for all these different assets. But we were stacking well, the assets. Yeah. So if you made a generic explosion on the ground versus one in the air, they're going to look different your tool basically does it all with the click of a button. Or if you had yours rotated. Rotated. And the generic explosion would shoot it sideways instead of shooting it like straight and up. Gravity like starts looking weird. And we had right, a minute yeah. and it looked okay, but that took me two weeks destroying all the things. And it was like, oh my God. But what's great about this is we just swap it. It breaks. And we know, you know, Tim, where those things are falling. So now when they hit water, they splash. When they hit the ground, we have debris. So we're able to play right. all these animations to really sell the explosion. And that, that and, and is actually, that's sort of an interesting thing that was I was able to do is just look at when something was falling. And if the keyframe shifted the velocity really quick, I knew it hit something. Like if it hit water or if it hit the ground, and then I can play a particle effect based on that animation file. Oh, wow. That's a really creative uh, workaround or solution. So yeah, yeah, it's clear that this went through iterations, right? So you you make the thing, you test it out in the game, you see what's working, what's not working, and you just kept iterating on it, and then it, yes, yeah. it, it is what it is in the game now. That's fantastic. When it comes to uh, like loading things in, obviously the structure of this game, it's like a big open world. Uh, you can go to different parts of the game at different times, right? I'm sure there's not many uh loading times how do you actually load those different sectors in? i, I want to jump to the world building tool video now and maybe you can talk a little bit about uh about how do you load in the different chunks of the world 
Uh, yeah, there chat? you go. You wanna Me? take this chat? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you made a tool that I usually use the sector. At the beginning, we use the sector because uh, Unity don't have the you know open world setup for the game that we use. When we started this, this project, is Unity Five, so there's nothing. Uh, we basically use a sector and use uh, the, the the plugin called Sector, and the sector is uh, you can see it, it's a two D grid. We set up like like a two D grid. Then you just load each sector, put each sector in a scene. Like each of them is a scene, then you load it based on where your player is surrounding. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, th this tool is just showing that within our world building process, we have uh, what's called proxies. So they're just low resolution versions that you see in the distance instead of seeing the actual sector. But we have one scene that has all of these proxies for the whole world. And we click on a proxy and then we can say, well, import that sector so I can work on it, uh, world build it or add item, or whatever, and then save it. Uh, this went through a lot of iteration throughout the whole process because right. the first iteration of this was using the entire just the sector system that they had built and i added like the proxy system on top of that but then multi-scene editing came on fine and then i i changed it all over to multi -scene. it was a much quicker way than the old sector way which took forever to load in and out so what do you do about objects that exist like between the grids so like maybe you have like a big object so that in um the objects pivot determines which sector it's in so I like see. when you go to save a sector there's a something like i save it by uh pressing something in a different way where it will look for all the objects beneath within each sector so if you move something from one sector to another unity doesn't automatically change the scene it's in it just kind of moves it that to that position but then before it saves our tool will say well now reparent it to this sector, mm. move it to a new scene Immediately. based yeah move it to the right scene based on it that saves you time <laughs> for yes moving, yeah. making sure every object is in the right place <laughs> yeah but otherwise no, you'd have objects floating all sorts of places in the wrong and, and how do you split the terrain so like because i'm sure the terrain is one piece right so how does that how does it cut the terrain up um we did that really early on with some terrain splitter tool mm -hmm. i mean uh looking back at it now like now unity has the tools to just make neighbor terrains which would have been nice at the time but yeah it was <laughs> like yes. many of it was tools, yeah <laughs> yeah it was like one giant terrain and the tool just split it up for split us and, okay. uh we determined how it was named and over time like we've gotten rid of a lot of terrain because we had the world just like massively bigger but a we realized it was just too big. But our team I see, I see. Um, we have a question uh, from the chat. So, hey, could you ask Chen if he's still proud of his snow deformation tech? I know it grabbed a lot of us in the Kickstarter. So, yeah, Chen, could you maybe talk about that and maybe what the inspiration behind the snow de snow deformation tech was? So, so because of this game is a snow, you know, environment. So we want to make it more believable and one thing one gameplay i think we want at the beginning is that you can see the trail from the animal or enemy then that for example that the rabbit and you can see the trail and you can follow it and hunt it down so <laughs> when we want this and i so originally i was a graphics programmer mm. when i first in the industry so mm -hmm. I look at all different, you know, document, white paper for the graphics, shader, and everything. Uh, one thing I saw early is uh, Batman. I forgot which one. Arkham uh, one Knight? Asylum? Arkham. Asylum? Knight? Who's the first one? one of those. Asylum. I forgot. Arkham maybe. Asylum. Yeah. So that one, they may even in xbox 360 they able to make the deformed snow they are the i i believe they are the first one 
But at that time, when they made it, the snow only on the flat screen, flat flat uh, ground. And but for us, that that doesn't work. We have terrain, so I take their white paper and change it, modify it to fit what we want and what we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can actually take a look at that. Uh, we can pull up the video for like how you do the storm. Yeah, so that's something else. So we're going to jump into that, into the storm cycle. But right before that, the um, in Batman, I guess you, you were saying that it's more flat. But it's here you had... Flat. Yeah. It's it's so basically how you do the default snow is the upside down camera. Right. For the shadow. I see. The shadow okay. is, is the from inverse. top down, right? Top down or, or like sideways or something. But normally it's top down. And... Mm -hmm. Or for the snow, how you know the player is on the snow or, or, or something is that you put the camera from the bottom up. Right. Then right. How, that's how you know the height. Okay. So so then you were able okay. to apply snow to not just a flat surface, but any all of your terrain. Yeah, you have to pre we pre bake it. Okay. We pre bake so you know the terrain height. Right. So if you were to make a change to the terrain, you'd then have to rebake that section. You have to rebake. We have the yes, tool yeah. that we just hit rebake. Yeah. And it's it's like it's so fast. It's, I mean, it's oh nice. It's not like light baking or anything like that. It's just no, like an no, immediate. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. yeah. That would be that's bad. great. That would take some time. Okay, that's 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 really nice. So, um <clears throat> so to achieve, you know um to push that winter feel and look, you also had to work on the like the atmosphere and the post-processing, right? And I believe you have like storms that come in and out in the game. So yeah, we can jump to the storm cycle video. And maybe you want to talk about the, that ring of particles that like encompasses the player to achieve the uh, that effect. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I I mean I'll I'll talk real quick and then go ahead. Tim can. So the just you know the video I try to take a video of it in Unity to show you guys, but the recorder mm -hmm. tool doesn't let me do it in Unity. So you'll just sort of see it in this shot. Okay. um down when he i think when she goes over to the edge but um and i apologize for that like i tried but i couldn't um but these are just debug tools that we're showing right here that you can just you know that that tim set up that you can turn on and off storms but go ahead nice. Tim. you can explain the system um yeah so this is just when a storm comes in so we have a few things that interact to make the storms change the whole environment one thing is the fog comes in like i think we have like exponential fog and that comes in a lot closer to the player when the storm and it like smoothly moves in closer uh so it reduces your how far you can see um the other thing is there's this ring of particle fog that we have around the player there's like three different rings and the first one's like small particles medium particles, and really far out big particles and that uh gives this just extra depth like to the end, like you can notice it here on the mountain and stuff. And from up high, it starts to like if you take the camera really up high and look down, it starts to break down a little bit. But from ground level, it gives this nice depth to like um, like a foreground, mid ground, and background. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, the storm systems uh, and how it plays with like day night and how it plays with just skybox and all of that wow. took a lot of edge case tweaking to make sure that it all fades in and fades out at the right time because it's multiple systems working all together to change all the colors and things that was really beautiful seeing it just turn to night like that right <laughs> well, there, that's, right there yeah. at the end it doesn't yeah. happen that that's why they like quickly that was me just going from no for sure like it yeah. still, yeah. yeah. still look good though that, that looked great yeah yeah that's that's yeah. all tim setting all that up so that's been, it's amazing. that was super cool it's it's a lot of setting up like uh, animation curves to say like during this time of day this is when this color or this value changes to this thing and and then you have to just like go to each time of day and tweak to make sure everything lines up mm -hmm. and bring in a storm at each time of day to make sure the storm is made properly too yeah so, and those tools have all gotten way way better over time it used to be. I think with the older sky, sky systems that we talked about, it was a lot more work um, for you, Tim. I think now it's to the point where an idiot like myself could could actually figure it out a little bit. Well, the the <laughs> old sky, we had an old sky system that was like very dynamic. 
and we ripped a lot of it out because it was just too much. Yeah. But that, but but now with the, the more static skybox that just sort of turned on a pivot now, it's much easier to control the sky with the weather storms. Yeah. Amazing. And it helps too, like to yeah. create <clears throat> using that because we looked at a. I think we were looking at. I think Breath of the Wild at that point had come out, and I think Horizon Zero Dawn. They had a couple different solutions, but they had sort of these little little puff clouds and stuff that would just sort of show up in the for like kind of the immediacy yes, yeah. of the character and that helps give a sense of like you're trying to tell the player that there's wind or you're trying you know and you can have sound that does that but if someone's not playing with sound you want to be able to show that so obviously we have little flecks of snow and stuff that can come in and a big part of cold it impacts the player's progression right um where cold can start to hurt you over time now you can upgrade your outfits you can you know light fires and do all these other things um within the game uh, and depending on your difficulty, you know, that can also be adjusted, but primarily it was to, um, give context to like, like you can see like the, the, I've set it to a little bit of, um, snow. So like just small bits of snow are coming in, but then when these huge storms hit, it really starts to impact you. And then same with the snow depth, right? So the deeper the snow, the slower you go, which can get trickier if you're in combat. Um, it's harder even when you sprint through it, like we had the, all these really deep systems, um, that let you know which is interesting over time especially in early access how much those systems can can be adjusted and tweaked um mm -hmm. from from player feedback and especially we did like a beta with our kickstarter backers and most of them never mentioned um uh, you know their feelings uh in terms of a negative response to survival but when we enter early access we saw a I mean, more vocal minority of people that wanted that to be there but not impact the player so um the nice thing is the systems are are flexible enough to to allow for you know you to be able to enjoy it or really feel the full brunt of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super interesting. Thanks for sharing that. So let's uh well let's wrap it up with uh we're so curious because like Hassan mentioned earlier, you guys are self published. You also ported in house too, which when we were in her rehearsals, we were kind of surprised by <laughs> um, <laughs> for many reasons. But why don't you talk about your choice to um, porting on many consoles too? uh chen can talk about the joys of porting i'll just talk about <laughs> at least the kind of the business side of why we wanted to port so i think a lot of smaller studios um will work with the publisher to do the port and um there's obviously a lot of business reasons why you'd want to do that but there's also a lot of risk involved where i think for a game that maybe isn't as i mean we were pushing a lot of um we were pushing a lot of tech into new places that I think uh, what we were hearing, at least even from kind of platform, our platform uh, partners, was that at the time Unity was pretty hard to shift onto console um, for a number of reasons. And it was, you know, older Unity, newer Unity obviously is getting much, much better at, at um, uh, multi-threading and a bunch of other things. And so we had some concerns about, you know, can we find a, a, a publisher that a is a real publisher because unfortunately there are a lot of I would call publishers, which I call fake publishers, <laughs> that that really just are trying to sign you into a bad deal. That's good for them. Um, Avoid and, the publishers. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's frustrating <laughs> to be honest. You, know, yeah. you get a lot of those, and and they I you know maybe they mean well, but it's hard to you know want to work with 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 people that are saying they can port your game in a month. You know, it's like please. Like I've, you know, when you, you, you porting a game can take a long, long time. And, and while it may be easy, uh, on paper to sign a deal, like it's even sometimes those deals can take months to set up and get really set up. Right. You know, they can do things like write a first refusal on your next project. If you're delayed, I mean, there's just all kinds of things. And as a new studio, the last thing we want to do is get stuck in a situation where the port is bad and we can't fix it the port has issues and we can't fix it because it's tech that we haven't written. Um, uh, the uh, port somehow has some weird clause in it that now they somehow own the tech that we can, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things that as a new studio, we wanted to just own everything so that, as I said earlier in the stream, like I would love to work on this game or game or this sort of game um, for uh, until I decide to retire if possible. Like it's awesome. It's and, and to have the ability to sort of scale or shift if like, Hey, you know what? It sold well or did well on steam, but it did really well on this console. 
or are, you know, after working with these platform holders, they're really excited about helping us on the next one, you know, and, 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 and that help can be come up in a different bunch of different ways. Sometimes they help with the port. Um, but if we've already done the port, we can enter negotiations, not in the sense that like, we're going to get a better deal, but we can at least have some experience and, and help them better understand like, well, actually I, I, I think, you know, how long you think it's going to take, it's going to take a lot longer. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, yes, we were nuts, absolutely nuts to do this. Um, the way we did, I, I think if we had finished the game first and then done the port, I think it could have been easier. Um, uh, but it's certainly been, uh, <laughs> A lot of effort, both, you know, Chen can really get into the weeds on it. Chen but, is just like um, nodding as hard as he can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that. So those are our reasons why. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely a lot of reasons. A lot of, uh, we've talked to a lot of other studios just like similar to you. They said like it was really important for them to own the tech because, you know, they've already used it for other things, future projects. They're very yep. future facing. I think uh, you're one of the first uh studios that we've like interviewed on Twitch that were like really future facing uh, throughout, you know, you understood that everything that you were building, everything that we were doing, every port portion of it would end up being used for something else in the future. And I saw that happen yesterday too. And, you know, like they're already working on media entertainment and like making shows with the tech that they created. So it's like, it's never lost. But um, to that end, I mean, Chen was the one who did it. So how do you feel about that? <laughs> so, so I'm the one doing the porting, right? So when I start doing the porting, my job title be from the programmer become a janitor. Yeah. So, <laughs> Which so, is really so, funny. <laughs> so the, the, the reason become a janitor is a... There you go. We officially, a, we're going to we're gonna give you an official <laughs> title change after this janitor from now on. There he is. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the reason is that you we 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 have the you pretty much need, need to do the same system uh, the same game system in different platform so you're doing okay. the same thing over and over that's why i become a janitor <laughs> <laughs> and the 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 people think that i heard before like oh the porting is fucking. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's really easy. You just click <laughs> Unity button. <laughs> you just click the button, and Unity will build it for you, and everything is great. You are yeah, you porting to export. another. Export as. Export. <laughs> yeah. Oh hell Done. no, man. Hell no. Yeah. <laughs> Even I, I, I'm like. I'm officially from Unity, <laughs> and I officially have to say that it should be that easy. But I'm also we used to be the community manager, so I know <laughs> what people are saying about it. So <laughs> it's, it's not that I, it's not that Unity's fault. That the reason is uh, I don't think it's anybody's fault. It's yeah. just a different platform, different system. You know, different console. They have different hardware, and different mm -hmm. hardware they have different architect. And you just have to adapt to it. And when you hit the export button, you just ex export it. But they, they, for example, uh, we already have a user system, user account system in Steam, and safe and low is a PC, and achievement for Steam. But when you port it in, the, for example, PlayStation 4, they have their own API. Mm -hmm. So you have to use their API to do it. And there's nothing Unity can done. You have to do it yourself. That's what I mean. Like, it's the same system. We already have it, but I have to do it again. And the same thing to do with Xbox. I just have to do it again. <laughs> and for performance, uh, <laughs> That's why we we say oh we're doing we, we we when we when we optimize it in different platform they have different architect and that's the point we do three step forward two step back mm -hmm. because we, they have different requirement different system they different they the CPU is different GPU is different and. Sometimes the particle <laughs> is implement 
differently. The Unity, they, they implement maybe a little bit differently based on different the, the console. And so maybe in PC is fine, and but in Xbox is not, not good or like PlayStation is not good. So we have to optimize for it. Like the explosion is one one main thing. We take it out from dynamic to the the, the tool we built is because like the console just can't handle it. Yeah. yeah. So and, and and the good thing is I'd say even from that though is low end PC gets a bump. So like people yes. that were having yeah. frame mm -hmm. rate issues also get and our tech in general gets sort of a bump in that it's more flexible. Um, yeah. And I'd say too, like on the console side that you um, could have, or, you know, that I'd add to that is uh, on uh, when you're doing like the achievement stuff as well, or even save stuff, like for certification, you know, they all have different certification kind of rules or guidelines, like how they want, like if the power turns off, you know, you, the save system has to be able to do X, Y, and Z, or, you know, controller options need to be set up this way. I mean, just, Lots of little things that while it's easy to do or like straightforward from a, how do we solve it? The back end of it still has to be structured in a way that it's, you're still, you're basically making a, a, a separate game really for each yeah. one. And, and that's, I think what's, unfortunately, it's really hard to, you know, put that in a elevator pitch slash marketing thing for, for <laughs> really anybody who doesn't get into the weeds on this i mean even i'm pretty um uh what's wrong ignorant to you know how much work chen has put in um it's where sometimes i'm like just dude i don't understand just do this just do, <laughs> just that. do it i've learned i've <laughs> honestly learned to not use the word just and like just. remove it from <laughs> emails because it does it it, it, it oversimplifies and sort of yeah. you know negates the sheer amount of well the effort maybe for any one of us to do the work it's the you know the stress and the you know one more thing to add to the list of things that i have to get done um while i'm still trying to make sure that is this even cool right and that's sort of my thing where it's like we're i've mentioned before like we're sort of in a plane that's flying and we're building it and we're trying to land it and then i lost my analogy yesterday when we were talking <laughs> about that but like there's like all these different runways and you have to have all these different ways of landing the plane but they all have to be the same plane oh and if this plane doesn't okay. run at the same frame rate it's like oh and so i love it you, you yeah you got that okay i love the analogy you had time to yeah. think about it it was great <laughs> yeah I, I wrote it out no i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> and you know like that's the thing up. Yeah, like, you know, you've been developing the game for years, like you said, and I think you can comfortably just predict that there will be a new console coming out or a new something or a new GPU that will change <laughs> everything, apparently, according to yeah. people. <laughs> I mean, it was it was really cool to be a part, um, and, you know, uh, to, to get in with um, on like the early uh, PS5 stuff, because that was really cool. And it, you know, in a lot of ways, it... Um, allowed us even the opportunity to, to look at like, well, what, what can we push with what time we have? And that's how, like I said, the stuff like photo mode and all those things really got doubled down on. And then, um, like with dual sense, that was really cool. I'm a huge, uh, I love like, I'm a kind of a sucker for those kinds of things. I think in the, the dual sense is so like rumble is neat, but like dual sense is really, really cool and makes things like our grappling hook and like this, the feeling of like walking through snow and, even our wind is like kind of with the direction of the wind will come over like directionally on the, the controller. So like, there's a lot of neat things that, um, we were able to implement, um, that are actually, you know, a lot of ways, very unique to what the PS five can do. So I'm not trying to be like, Oh, it's better than whatever, but like, that was just really cool. Um, and then at the same time, I think we're able to, because our backers overall been so patient, like this was at least one way for a subset of them to get that have been you know, unable to, because we did get early access keys to pretty much everybody. Um, once, once we released an early access, so even console backers have the access to it, um, to those keys. So that way they're not completely in the dark. Some though, just either country based, it can't, you know, the PCs they can get are too expensive or whatever. But, um, you know, that was certainly something that, uh, you know, 
we were excited to to be able to be a part of and yeah that future proofs our tech in a way so like the next game we're not like well how do we do it on right. these news consoles like we we're able to at least speak to it if if chen isn't gonna want to do it again <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure no. yeah 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 <laughs> It's no. not wasted. And I think it will be, uh, you should immortalize the fact that he's, you know, put blood, sweat and tears into it by making, well, chat has been like going crazy. Oh, there yeah. should be a Chen's broom. They're suggesting it's a golden <laughs> broom and there should be, a, the damage should be called Hung Sweeping Menace or Liao's <laughs> API Destroyer. So. And people Chats. are saying with Chen, Chat looking just as the Chen, there's no broom for error. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Oh my god. <laughs> make it make it happen. Uh, <laughs> oh Let's a weapon god. description. Uh, oh my god. Uh, so if that, if that weapon doesn't show up in the game at some point, I'm going to be very disappointed. Yeah, very uh, disappointed. <laughs> Chat's expecting it now. You set it up. I have a feeling. I have a, yeah, I feel like we're going to start seeing some fan art or uh, <laughs> images of Chen with the broom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please clip this moment so we can yeah. remind them later. Yeah. <laughs> chat, chat is so great. They're like, live, laugh, liao. <laughs> like, <it's> so <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so good. The memes. Chat, chat oh, is like man. all the memes for this stream so far. It's great. Yeah. But thank you. Like, I, I'm really uh, happy. Awesome. Yeah. I'm really happy you, talk, you got to talk about it because I think that is something that um, a lot of studios don't know about. They never thought about. You talked about the pros and cons. Like, I really like that you guys both had like really two different uh, opinions going into it. But yeah, in the end, it, it is worth it uh, if you are really future thinking. And uh, that's really great. Um, there were a few more questions, but I think we there was one technical question. Uh, this is probably for Chen. Um, they were asking, um, I think you're using 3D Studio Max uh, for all your 3D stuff. But they wanted to know because they wanted to know what your workflow like uh, workflow was like for the mapping of the climbing area because you know reworking on the character means redoing the climbing path grapple areas and all that so do you have a workaround for that? Oh, uh, so when I would make the characters, usually I mean, just from a like a quick prototype style, um, like for this guy in particular, I think he started actually. So we the the first boss you ever saw was we refer to as like the Yeti. And that was just kind of like we at one point thought if well if we can't get i think enough funding or whatever else we would make like yeti hunter which was like yep. there would just be these big yetis and you would just sort of run around and like that would be it that would be the game like and we just like yeah okay well at least we can try that and so uh that was sort of something we we're going after and then um when we were like when well, we need to you know make a new bosses or if we have our funding everything else um I took that original rig and body and started playing with it. And then uh, what I would do is just kind of go into ZBrush and just be real loose with sort of a design of the character uh, and and just throw it in and just you can just set to climb. Right. So that means it's all climbable. And then I would just sort of path out, like draw sort of a path, talk with Tim about it. Like, I think this could work. And because mm -hmm. most of our tech was in place, you could get a flow, a feeling of flow kind of of where the character would go and how it would would work. So once we actually got to like the painting on part of it, usually I'm making because of how the tech works, I have to make a pretty low poly cage of, of what and the cage would be sort of a representation. That's why like we were painting these pretty big triangles in that video. And that's what you see the visual may be higher resolution with fur and all these additional effects, but the underlying mesh of, of for physics and deformation and stuff is typically a lower poly mesh. And so that's where it gets to be a little trickier in terms of like the max workflow. And for a while, actually, I would have to sort of make a mesh, eyeball it, and then take it into this collision painter thing. But then over time, Chen gave me a tool that allowed me to, or like a shader, like a vertex color shader, that would allow me to sort of set up in sort of using from a 3D Studio Max perspective, I would use uh ids like material ids and i would just make two materials one that's gray one that's green and apply those mm. sort of in max as i would work to sort of eyeball it and then that would be uh, somehow that was able to be visually represented in the game so after by about like a sometime in early access we had it really ironed out where you could get and paint sort of these objects up and have them deform and actually see the green path at runtime and, and figure out where where things were without before it used to be like we couldn't do that so it'd be 
you know, we have other, like I would have to UV it and texture it and, and kind of go that route. Um, so this freed us up to be able to be a bit more, uh, quick to prototype if that explains it. I mean, that's it's mm-hmm. at least how it used to work, um, and how it works now. So did the, was it like, uh, was it mostly for prototyping reasons and for speed that like you only had climbing specific areas when you first in the first iteration and now it's become free climbing or is that something that you always knew you wanted to have free climbing? So free. So when we first did our demo um, like the pitch kind of demo stuff, the game could always be, it's, it's, I think it's a layer and we just say set to climb and the character will then just climb on whatever mesh physics uh, collider is there um, or is able to climb it. <clears throat> Cause we, we also don't do like an automatic climb. We, we prototype that mm. it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible for deforming physics because if the character climbs it, usually an auto climb is set to like either a layer that's set to climb. Well, if our whole boss is set to climb, like that's not going to work. Um, and you want to be able to let go and, and, and grab when you want. Right. And if it's just automatically happening, there's more edge cases where it's going to be worse, especially if it's on based off angle where, you know, and deforming the angle is always changing. So we were like, when we started doing that uh, first demo, we, we had really just set a very neat, like careful path. And I think we were going to use like handprints to denote where you could climb. Cause like, mm-hmm. if you look at like last of us and uh, I'm trying to think um, uh, uh, uncharted, a lot of like these very third person type games will have like white edges and ledges. I think even to a certain extent, last guardian did that where like things you can grab and climb are sort of color denoted. But when breath of the wild came out, which is really one of the few like climbing centric games that have come out recently you know, that was something we really had to look at um because so many of our systems actually originally came from skyward sword um because i was a huge skyward sword fan i played with my son when he was super little he would swing the wiimote i would use the nunchuck and we played that for years and so i remember very early on the character didn't even have jump because we were like let's go real low scope and so if you look at like the the spire the 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 stamina wheel that was really more skyward sword centric like we were looking at that and how is that going to work you know this idea that stamina is sort of this timed out thing um grapple hook was you know primarily from how skyward sword and so like a lot of that stuff was was there and uh when then so then the survival stuff was like kind of daisy ish and the idea that like hey if you have this item you can you know uh, you know if you have a club you can swing it through fire and now it's a fire thing all those things and then nintendo reached out to us and we talked with them sort of showed them the build and chatted for a while and then breath of the, and i was dying to know like what the hell's the nx i remember that meeting and then <laughs> uh and they were like we can't tell you and i was like is you know i can get into that but basically <laughs> in, the, in the end breath of the wild is announced and i'm like holy crap this makes so much sense why maybe they were maybe wanted to know what we were up to um because there's so many similarities and mm. even what Breath Well does to what Shadow Colossus does. I mean, people say the sailcloth is Breath Well, but there was a parachute in Shadow Colossus that you could unlock. So like there's a lot of things that like they both share uh, quite a bit. So we really you know looked at that and we're like, well, you know, climbing everywhere is certainly something we would have always th- thought to do. That was so most most sort of tied with like how could it work? Like would people want to play that? And so it obviously became very obvious to us that, yes, that's really what is going to work. And so we just basically flipped the switch. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was more like from an open world perspective and and really like game design, like what can you climb versus what can't you climb? Um, Because if you make it climb everywhere, you add risk to like players going into spots you don't want them to be or having to design around that. So ice became sort of the big negator like the ice and then we did like m- like these kind metal. of gold metal that like she can't really mm-hmm. grab onto metal um but she can grab really anything that's like man-made stone or rock or these kind of grapple hook spots and then obviously on top of that fur um we looked at doing ivy but the weird thing with that was like you're in this wintry world ivy really that would be gone like it wouldn't really be there so yeah and foliage is kind of a pain in the butt in itself so we wanted to avoid dealing with uh foliage so right um so um on that note one more question uh technical question uh regarding the environment and uh, the locations and stuff so in terms of environment development did you disperse the models around generally randomly or or is each location handcrafted oh 
it was it was handcrafted. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, there was a lot of work that went into each location. Um, a lot of it's too. You, we pulled out like a camera and would get a good view of like where the player would walk up and see to try to find like a, a good composition in the area first, and then walk through it and try to find a good path to that area. Make sure it's fun. Uh, and a lot of that is Brian and I back and forth. Oh, okay. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. your world I, is I, massive. I, I would add to that. <laughs> I, I would add to that too, that like we started and we have, and Tim has added some procedural stuff where like when you place rocks, I think with, we use vegetation studio. So there's some biome type stuff. We, we snuck in. It tr and, yeah. Trees, trees used to be hand plated and yeah. placed and all of the other foliage hand placed until we got vegetation studio. And then it was like, okay, just mark out where you want it to be. And, that yeah that helped a lot but in terms of like even terrain we spent a long time trying to understand like what is fun in in building terrain like from a design perspective and mm -hmm. if your character is like you know mount versus not mount or speed right we looked at scale being something that was really relative versus like if you just make something that's super far away and you go hey go from point a to point b you know like that can be really boring feeling if it's just straight so we tried to really create senses of like zigzagging triangle shapes like and breaking that down to be like you know coming up on a triangle right you don't know what's around it and if you come up and over the top of it like you can jump off the top and then like sail or whatever yeah. else and you want your different forms of movement as you're going so like you're yep. walking running climbing jumping sail cloth maybe a little swimming like yep. you mix it all to try to make it interesting um yeah, and we did a lot of run throughs so like what's the distance where we started getting bored with running like, yeah and we played a lot with that also those were a uh, lot the early builds i'd say also a a kind of a a trick i use is arches so arches and yep. uh because people i think were kind of hardwired to go through doorways so when you create arches there's sort of create senses of like interest visual interest as well as you can tell the player in, in a way like maybe you want to go through that or like going through rings like multiple platformer games were all about like pilot wings right like going through like rings of balls yep. which get you points like uh mario kart you know you're zipping through and you're trying to collect things and and you typically there's like arches that you're going through and so it's just that that cop coupled with um we used height we started to really impress upon height more than traversing over distances because we realized, hey, we're climbing and jumping and sailclothing and grappling. Like you're in air a lot more, which is or which can be a lot of fun. Um, and then that really reinforces, hey, you're going to want to climb more. You're going to want stamina. So we we hide things that you potentially have to climb or traverse to versus just having it all kind of flat terrain. Because if you look at m a lot of games, they tend to just be sort of flat kind of arena and then a narrow path, flat arena and narrow path. And part of what we tried to employ was like, it's sort of a, a yellow brick road that would sort of zigzag to at least the first couple of bosses. Um, and that, you know, narrows the viewpoint of like where I need to go, but then creating the sense that when you go off in the other, uh, uh, you know, off, off the beaten path, so to speak, it's kind of flush with interest or items or, or risks. And uh, one other thing to add to that is like, we looked at Disneyland a lot. Like Disneyland is, mm -hmm. especially Disneyland versus Disney World, right? Disneyland, they cram so much content into a small area. And they're very good about like, when you turn a corner, all of a sudden you're in a new land. So we really, I mean, given our world is almost all snow, we did try to create, you know, through angles and turning to create different senses of, uh, I would I say point of interest or like location so that in your head you can remember like, oh, it's next to this giant statue that's doing this, or it's next to this giant eye object that's doing X, Y, Z. And that I'd say from, you know, the level design thing was something that did take us time to, to start to understand more like as a, a second nature. Um, but, you know, finding and looking at people that have done it successfully was a great way for us to sort of um, leapfrog that, uh, learning versus just brute force and trial and error. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for that. Very, uh, elaborate, <laughs> very complete answer, thoughtful answer. Um, <laughs> we're going to wrap up the stream, but before we do, I just want to do a very dramatic reading of Linod's uh, suggestion, um, for, 
um, oh, no. Chen's broom <laughs> idea <laughs> and how the scene <laughs> should be played out. Uh, so, sorry, it was not a, a light. It's uh, Aragon. And he says, okay, picture my idea. So picture this large foliage, overgrown church hall with mm. a giant in there. I Chen in armor, no mm. helmet, just his glasses and hair wafting in the air as he wields a glowing, shining broom. <laughs> and he just hands it to you. Perfect. Uh. <laughs> love it. Make I love it. So it's happening. It's going so, in. So, so, you're going in. so you're confirming that right now here on stream? Yeah. Exclusive? That made, yeah. I, I, I'm sure someone can create that image. I don't, I mean, let's Did shift you just the say game exclusive? first. Can we shift the game first? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like foliage and a church. I'm like, it's the game is in like a wintry tundra. <laughs> yeah, they just completely changed the. Scenario. Just change the complete, just completely change the <laughs> landscape. Just, yeah. just do that. Just just chuck all Snap the snow. The <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> so that we can uh, add a broom and shit. Yeah, love it. Thanks, chat. Uh, I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to your um, your mods. Then <laughs> it's gonna be great. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much, guys. This was so much fun. I think I I think Hassan and I definitely agree that you should come back on the stream and hang out with us and then let's play. You guys have such a wealth of knowledge between the three of you. It'd be really fun if you actually share some of that knowledge that. and give critiques to some of our budding game developers who are always um, submitting games to our monthly show. Case. I think it'd be really fun if you guys can play some of the games or watch you play some oh, of the that's games. Awesome. Yeah, guys, and then you guys do like yeah. a submittal thing. That's sweet. I didn't know yeah. that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Every, every month. Exactly. Yeah. Every month we do a, a let's play showcase. So you guys can go there to play.unity.com and put then a keep, link in the chat. Yeah. Most of the time it's like first time developers. They're really surprising, honestly. Uh people submit really uh great things, but I think they're always looking for feedback. So I think all three of you are coming from such different backgrounds can give so much advice on game design, level design, art, uh, like you know, the tech, the programming, where they can move to next. So I think it'd be really fun to have you on to the stream. No pressure yeah. on me saying this live and like yeah. basically Valen told cool. you to do it. <laughs> I, 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 that'd be awesome. Cool. That'd be cool. great. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you guys. This is going to wrap yeah. up day two of, of We Love Indies Week. Um, mm -hmm. Tomorrow we have one more stream up for you. It's going to be from Studio Fizbin. They brought you great games like Lost at Sea and Say No More, all great made with Unity games as well. But tomorrow we're going to check out uh, Minute of Islands. This is an amazing game. If you love uh, Pendleton Ward and Adventure Time, this is the game for you. They have a really unique, beautiful art style. So come check yeah. out how they got they put that game together. Hassan Another and I. handcrafted game. Another handcrafted game. Very, very mm -hmm. tediously handcrafted game. Um, that's the only kind of thing we like here. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the two, that's the 2D one, right? So they hand drew all that? Is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Big, massive wow. drawings. Bigger, like the, 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 I mean, they'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but like, are Some of their serious? files were too big for Photoshop, right? So they Holy. had to clip things together. So it's going to be great. Come check it out. That's wow. a little yeah. teaser. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the, wow. I think that's the theme of this week, Kyle, right? Like yeah, handcrafted, lovingly the made hard way. games. The hard way. Yes. Definitely yes. the hard way. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot, chat. Uh, you guys were really awesome. Thanks for hanging around and for all the amazing questions. Sorry, my dog just pulled my headset. <laughs> there we go. So sorry. <laughs> she was so great the whole time. That's a first. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's time to go walk my dog, and I'm sure you guys had <laughs> to go Have to your dinner. Dogs to walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much again, um, Brian, Tim, Chen. This was a really great time. Uh, I'll see everyone uh, tomorrow. All right. Have Thank you, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. So much. Bye. Bye. Bye.